Hey, if you got this part of the video, you got the live edition. Home Gadget Geeks Thursday night, uh, the last, uh, the last day. Is today the last day? Yeah, the last yeah. day of March, right? It's March sixtieth. Yes, today, <laughs> right? And no, fiftieth. No, no, it's March sixtieth, and uh, we've had uh, you, you've made it through. We're almost in May, and uh, we appreciate you guys coming out. Tonight, if you're visiting with for, with us for the very first time, in other words, it's the first time you've come out to be a part of Home Gadget Geeks, welcome. We're glad that you're here to be a part of it. We'll do a little beer pour to get things kind of going, and then we'll get into the show. If you've never joined us before and you've come to hear the, the topic, uh, and it's the recorded version, just skip ahead a little bit because we're going to goof around for a few minutes, pour some beer, and kind of uh, just enjoy uh, being around each other for a while. So either way, long play podcast. If you're hoping to come for a seven minute discussion on whatever the title was, this is not that. We are a long play. We're going to be around a while. It's a great community. We'd love to have you join us. If you want to see all the programs that are at least scheduled, you can head out to theaverageguy.eventbrite.com. That'll get you there. If you want to join us in our Discord group, facebook.com slash no. If you want to join us, I said Discord and then I said you want to join us in Discord, the average guy.tv slash Discord. Facebook is the average guy.tv slash Facebook. We'll get started here in just a second. Mike, we are on our final beer from uh from Andy. Andy Coffee sad sent day. us. I, I know. know it is kind of it is kind of sad, Andy. So Andy, you could too. If you want to send us and, yeah. and kind of sponsor the pre-show beer, you can do that as well. Send me an email, Jim at the average guy.tv. Send us your favorite beers. Uh, one for me, one for Mike. Uh, we will share those, or I'll share those with Mike, and we'll do that today. Uh, so we're still on uh, on Open Road Brewery uh, out of Wayland, Michigan, and tonight we've been saving. I think maybe the best for last, uh, Missy Margarita. It is a mead, which I'm pretty excited about. My Marine son, who's stationed at Camp Pendleton, he's in Okinawa now, but he has gotten he has gotten into meads over the last couple years. Cal big in Southern California. And um, he wants to come back to Nebraska and maybe brew some meats. So, Mike, we'll give it a pour. Why don't you open yours and give it a taste? Tell me what you think. I'm still can I just I can't get over the handwritten aspect of these beers, right? Like when they handwrite the date brewed, ABV, what type it is. I just think that's so cool. Um, okay, right. can someone more educated than me on beer? I don't know honestly what it's, a meat is. Okay, you so know? meat is made with honey, not so it's not it's not necessarily brewed like beer, but it's it's fermented honey. So it's going to be a sweeter. Interesting. Um, yeah, this is a six percent, and yeah, a meat is made from honey. So so cheers to that. And let's okay, go. this is the first mead by the way I've ever had. Yeah. Um, Brian, what what do you what do you? Oh, go ahead, Mike. Hold on. What do you what do you think, Mike? Um. I, okay, what does this taste like? This tastes like something I've had before. Not a beer, right? Uh, obviously, it's it's different than a it's, beer. It's it's like a it's, sour. It's almost like a like yeah. one of the sours I've had, which I really enjoy. So this is this is right up my alley. Yeah, no, they're they're pretty tasty. Uh, they they make them and they brew them in all kinds of different flavors. So you can get blackberry, blueberry, cherry, grape, lemon mead that is just dynamite and. Uh, a little more expensive, Brian. Have you had a Have you had a mead before? No, I haven't. No. Mm, okay. Uh, what are Nathaniel? you enjoying tonight? Oh, just a uh, Soda Stream seltzer. Mm. All right. <laughs> we talked. We talked about Soda Stream last week with okay. uh, with Aaron when she was on. That's a good way to do it. Nathaniel, what do you uh, What do you got? Um, I've got water with me tonight. Okay. With my near marathon sticker. Oh, nice. <laughs> I like that. But, um, hey, you know what? We switched we back over here. Of local hold on, beers. Hold, hold on, before Nathaniel, before you do that, we your mic switched. Got switched. Off. Yeah, mine. Um, yeah, it's not the ATR anymore. No, it when we changed? went back. Yeah, let's see if we can fix that. And Jim, actually, speaking of that, I don't know if the other two were getting it. I was there your audio was skipping for me. Oh, that's during that's the fun. intro a little bit. I don't, was oh, that yeah. just me, guys, or was were you getting? No, I, heard that too. I heard that too. Okay, yeah, you were skipping around a little bit. It's a little better now, but I'm still getting some skipping from you. Do you okay. disable there we go. audio processing? Oh, there no, we go. No, no, do, no. Don't we 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 that. leave that leave that okay. checked. So I'm back to the ATR. Yeah. Now. Oh, now you sound perfect again. It's all right. Good thing you caught it. Okay, right. what do you got? I just um, drinking water tonight, but I've got oh. all these different sours from Surly and Sociable Cider Works. And Voodoo Ranger, the new Belgian, they make good beers. So there's a wide variety. 
Do any of you guys know? So on a sour, I enjoy a sour, but honestly, I'm so uh, I don't know what the difference is in like the brewing process, what they're making it, like how different it is. Do any of you guys know, or do we just all enjoy them and, and not think about the process? Kind of like how we enjoy our meat, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how it's made differently. In my first introduction to sours, it was uh, not my favorite, but then you kind of they kind of grow on you, and you're like, oh, yeah. I really like this one. Not sweet. But just real sour, yeah. Different from an IPA, they're good. Like a cucumber sour is my new favorite. There's that white can that I see all the time everywhere. It's the cucumber one. I don't know who makes it, but it's uh, yeah. it's delicious. Mm-hmm. Now, are microbreweries a big thing in your neck of the woods too? Oh yeah, they are. Oh yeah, especially even in Omaha, we have a ton of them right around here, and and they make some really good beers. It's, it's almost hard to branch out because you're just so used to tasting, and there's so many here that it's hard to even say, okay, now I'm going to go try Minnesota because there's so many here in Nebraska that you takes a while to get through them all. We're the we, same we have, way. Yeah. We have like, like uh, probably any, about half a dozen micro breweries in the area and we're, you know, we're just, we're in the suburbs in the rural area. I mean, it's unbelievable. And where are you located, Brian? I'm in uh, long Valley, New Jersey, about 45 minutes from the um, Pennsylvania border near the Delaware water gap area. So okay. I'm in, Northwestern part of the state, pretty rural. And, um, you know, it's about an hour and 40 minutes west of New York city. I think that just shows, I mean, it doesn't matter where you're going. I think microbreweries are just absolutely ever, unless you are really in the middle of nowhere, which even right. there, there's probably a local guy doing some craft brews. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone mm-hmm. I think is enjoying craft breweries. So. Well, well, Mike, this is, uh, my favorite of the five that we tried. Yes. Uh, so I, I think I, the amber was my favorite. That's wow. but ambers are always my favorite. Um, but this is a this is definitely the second place for me too. Um, and yeah. I might have to give meads more of a try. Are these so, Jim? Like at our local high V, is it some of they sell meads yeah, there meads. too? Yeah, just ask for a mead. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Really it's just good. different. We used to have a meadery down here in Bellevue, not not very far from us, and they they brewed it down here, and they had you know you could get pizza and some stuff with it, but. It didn't, it didn't, it still hasn't really taken off in the Midwest and Southern California. I mean, you can be it, it, it almost outsells beer. Wow. That's interesting. Really? It's gotten really, really popular in the last couple of years. So yeah, my, my Tim is into it big time and he just, he loves his mead and you can, this 6% is actually pretty weak. So you could, most meads are seven, six, seven, eight, nine. Kind of, they're just a little, little more alcohol in them, and so they they come in smaller bottles, a little more expensive, a little harder to to manufacture. He, but, he should um, probably though have someone come over and taste test all those before oh, he gives them anyone else. Heck, so I mean, if you need someone, I'm just saying, I'm I'm you know across the city, I could just drive heck, on over and help. Heck yeah, test those out. heck yeah. yeah. If I can get you past Hannah, who's blocking <laughs> me. She is blocking me from you. <laughs> I told her that the other day. She goes, why does he think that? I'm like, it started off as a joke, and now it's just continued as the joke on the show yeah, that you block him and don't like what him going I, over. It's what she I goes, do. I loved him. She goes, well, she likes uh, she likes Sarah. Yeah. So well, yeah, let's be clear. Yeah. But she's like, Sarah's the more popular. That's one, like our. So. That's like my. Really, everyone comes to hang out with Hannah. They don't come yeah, to hang nobody, out with me. No, they're yeah. like, yeah. Could, could you go somewhere else? I want to talk exactly. to exactly. Yeah, I'm no, here to talk to the wife. I'm not here to talk to you. Way, Even guys. my buddies. I'm like, okay, cool guys. <laughs> All right, I go out and smoke some meat in the backyard or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, we did uh, pork shoulder today. Uh, first time I've done a midweek pork shoulder. Like it was, you know, we wanted we wanted pulled pork for dinner tonight. So. Uh-huh. At about 10 o'clock, I came upstairs. I was like, hey, Sammy, what are we doing for dinner? Because my daughter and I have kind of taken over the dinner duties. And I was, she's like, pork shoulder. I'm like, oh, I got to get that on right now. <laughs> we smoke that smoke, let that smoke for six or seven hours. And so, man, it was just smoked all day. It was just kind of fun to just pop out, you know, between mm-hmm. working and pop out and check it and get it. It was so delicious. So we had we have a ton left over. Okay. we I, I was kind of stalling for Chris. Uh, by the way, Andy, thank you for sending us those beers. If you want to. Have us uh, test it. I would. I think Nathaniel and I came up with an idea, Mike, that it maybe in the Discord group we'll start a poll or a, a, something where people can recommend beers to us, mm-hmm. and if we can buy them locally, that that's maybe a little bit easier than them shipping them to us. But yeah, not not all beers. Like we couldn't get we we couldn't get Open Road. This wouldn't be. This is a local only. So some of the more popular ones we can try. Maybe we can start a something in Discord where people can recommend and they can vote on them, and we can pick them up locally and try them. So you can do that. If you want to send us your beer, we'll take that too. Jim at the average guy TV. And I'll give you a, I'll shoot you my address and you can send it. Andy, I appreciate you sending those on. Yeah. Beer discord channel. 
Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm doing it right now. I'm creating a beer Discord channel. Okay. Now, everyone you're in there, let's make that not a place to discuss. Just just post the name, the name of the beer. Just post the name there and then go in there and you can do a reaction to it, like a plus ones. And we'll try the ones that get the most reaction. I think that'll yeah. keep it clean so it's not a bunch of uh, conversation. Yeah. You can talk about it up and be that's... barbecue or something or in general, but let's just have that be the suggestion list. And then you can react to them. And if yeah. if you really like something that someone suggested, let's do that. I'll uh, make it right now. If you want to, if you want to talk about beer, move it to the barbecue channel. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Because <laughs> they, go, they go hand in hand, right? They do. They do indeed. Okay, let me kick this thing off. Uh, Chris Nessie is is MIA. Chris, I hope you're okay. And uh, wherever you're at, I shot him a note, and uh, and I don't see him. Something must have come up, and that's okay. We we've got two of three. I think we're going to be okay tonight. So, all right. Let's get this thing started. Find my notes. All right, here we go. This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geek show number 443, recorded on April 30th, 2020. Here on Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studio in a beautiful Bellevue, Nebraska, Mike, since we are home many of us are home i don't know what it is but i'm kind of enjoying like when it's nice we get outside like it's it's so easy right like there's no excuse to not be outside just like right now there's really no excuse for a a not well-tamed yard uh same for being outside and i let me tell you with kids especially young boys there's no better saving grace than to have great weather on a day where I can go outside, let them run around, and I can get some work done yeah. uh, while they're doing that. We have been soaking up this weather as much as we can. And it has, I, I want to say, Jim, for Nebraska, this might be the longest streak of just gorgeous weather. Yeah. It's not too hot, not cold. Uh, it's It's been a, a breath of fresh air after some some weird spring, early spring cold weather that we were having. Well, I'm finding I'm just more sensitive to the weather than I was before because I can get out in it. Like when you, you know, when I was in the office, I'm in the office. It's not like I could just pop outside, you know, I guess I could, but I never really thought of it that way. Now I'm like, and it's going to be nice this afternoon. I'm going to rearrange my schedule so I can get some outside time. Uh, Nathaniel, have you, have you noticed like you're, you're just kind of more aware of like nice days than you were before? This yeah, all? definitely. I mean, we have a have a window that I can yeah. look out and I yeah. see the, you know, the neighborhood and it's closer. It just feels yeah. like the outside is closer, so getting up to go out, you know, a couple blocks, walk around with the dog, it seems less of a disruption than at work where you have to get up from your desk and go, you know. So, yeah, I yeah. try to get out more. I always do a walk in the morning before I get settled and sit down at the computer, you know, and right. uh, cuz I know I'm not going to get up for a while. <laughs> Brian, have you been, have you noticed that? Are you getting outside anymore? Absolutely. Unfortunately, the weather has been pretty crappy here in uh, New Jersey, uh, but uh, a nice days I get out and like try to walk for 45 minutes at least to an hour to get that, uh, get that walk in. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's been one of the benefits. It's been a huge benefit for me just of this being kind of this lot in this lockdown or work from home or yeah. shelter or whatever you want to call it. It is, uh, you know, I do these, just trips around the block and uh and we take a longer walk in a secluded area every day my, my daughter and i and it's just been great it's like i've i kind of feel more in tune to every day as opposed to all of a sudden it's friday yeah you know and the other thing too is i mean you know now preparing you know all my meals so i have much more control over caloric intake as well which has been uh been good for me as well i'm in the process of dropping some weight which uh, over the last couple of months well, well, good for you. That hasn't been the case for everybody. <laughs> like, or, or people are saying it's the COVID nineteen, you know, right. that that that's they going on to, there. They need to do social distancing from the refrigerator. Is that it, <laughs> Brian? I've been the same way. I've lost ten pounds since March. Yeah. I'm just eating yeah. less snacks. There's not yeah. donuts. There's not right. you know right. muffins and cupcakes and treats oh, and yeah. The, yeah. And you know the, it, teacher, the teacher's lounge is the worst, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's well, I have a bad habit of yeah, I have a bad habit of getting out for lunch and not going right. home or not doing leftovers and and not doing that. First of all, it saves a bunch of money. I was shocked how much money I was spending on lunches, even if I do eat at work or grab some in there. Uh, and then number two, the weight has been not that bad. Now I can drink more beer because I'm not taking in those calories with uh, right. <laughs> with the food. It's been yeah. awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm saving by eating. We have a cafeteria and it's pretty reasonable, but you know, even at maybe. $10 a day by the time I buy breakfast and I buy lunch. 
um, you know, that adds up at $50 a week and, you know, it's $200 a month. And all of a sudden you kind of go, wow. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. No, right on when you start adding it up that way. So there has been some positive benefits to that. I just, the work style has changed and I've tried to take advantage of some of those. I've mentioned this before these little micro workouts. So where I get up, I have a pull-up bar down here and I just grab that and do a couple pull-ups. Walk, walk away, do something else, come back, do some push-ups, go out for a walk around the block. So instead of one big workout, trying to spread that out throughout the course of the day, mm -hmm. just seems to make it a little more reasonable. My fit, my trainer has said, hey, at 50, at my age, doesn't matter if you get a 60-minute workout in or six 10-minute workouts in, right. it's the same thing. So right trying to just block, chunk those down into smaller blocks. And, yeah. and so for me, it's actually been really good. Yeah, it seems that the research is saying just, it's just important to keep moving, you know, and right. it, it does make a difference sometimes the intensity, but just that you keep moving. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's changed a lot of things. We're going to talk a little bit about that here just in a little bit, but it's just changed so many things. I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say. We'll remind individuals, if you want to listen to the show and download it off our mobile app, maybe when we get to travel again, it's the best way to listen to the show on the road because uh, it streams in and is super easy and convenient. HomeGadgetGeeks.com. Maybe download that to your phone just as an emergency on that time we do get to travel and you can have it available as well. We have a brand new show schedule uh, site as well out at Eventbrite. So if you go to the average guy TV, I'm sorry, the average guy .eventbrite .com, uh, you can see what's coming up next week. Mike, you mentioned the lawn. I applied fertilizer. We got two days of rain, perfect, like perfect rain. You know, it came and it watered it in. And now my lawn is <laughs> in like three days, like, whew. And so I got some mowing to do. Dave McCabe is coming on next week to talk a little bit about what he's doing on his lawn. But have it, I'm, I'm to the spot, I think I'm going to have to start mowing every three days, which being home is not a bad thing, right? No, mm -hmm. exactly. Get out on the lawn where I felt so bad. We had the uh, chemical guy come today and I didn't realize he was here, but we have a doggy door. And so all of a sudden I hear PD fire off. I'm on a call actually. I go, one second, I ran upstairs and my dog had cornered the the guy in the corner of our backyard and the guy was just standing there and you know, P's a pretty nice small dog, but Oh man, he was just <laughs> letting him have it. I felt terrible. Like, I'm so sorry. I took him inside and, uh, Man, that's it was, it was an awkward moment, but Petey was not happy to have a stranger all of a sudden in his backyard without me telling him he was going to be there. <laughs> Brian, Brian, you mentioned you've been having some bad weather. Has yeah. that has that slowed down? Do you have to? Are you a lawnmower? Do you have to go out and get your, or do you have it done for you? I have it done for me. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's I have the the Mario Andretti of lawn mowing. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Nathaniel. What about? What about you? Do you got a, a you're, a, you're of, a couple of weeks behind us. Yeah, right? we're behind yeah. you. We've got, we've had cold weather. It's just starting to get nice occasionally. And then we got some rain. So I expect in the next week or so, the grass will really kind of green up with some rain and warm weather, but I haven't mowed yet. Barely okay. raked. <laughs> yeah. We're, well, we're I, that we were that way just last week. And then of course we got some, we got some really good weather and it seems like when that grass pops in the spring, it pops big time. And we hit that window. McCabe's out there measuring the temperature of his dirt oh. to know when to apply. We're going to talk about that all next week. You're going to want to join us here for 444. But um, I, I'm not that sophisticated. I just put down some some Scott's fertilizer. Some stuff I bought pre-lockdown. Bought the whole summer's worth of chemicals. Thank goodness. And then they're just sitting in the shed uh, waiting to go. So we got that coming on um, next week. Uh, last week, big thanks to Aaron Lawrence who joined us and she always does a great job and Aaron's great to have on here and we had a lot of great gadget talk. And so if you missed 442, you can go back and get that big thanks to Aaron who joined us T tonight. We kind of have been planning the show for a month. That might be the longest I've ever planned to home gadget geeks. We started talking about what are the effects It actually came out of a conversation in another show we were having. Nathaniel said, oh man, I am in the middle of this. And I thought, what have you learned? And so we started talking about some things and this show was was kind of born out of that. Um, we So we're going to spend some time kind of tonight talking about the effects. How has it affected your area? So the, the guests we have on tonight all come in at education a little bit differently. And, uh, and um, we're going to hear from them on how the COVID-19, how the coronavirus has kind of changed things for them and the impact it has. And then Gentlemen, I, I kind of want to ask you, what do you think as we get towards the end of the show, how do you think it's going to change things in the future? So that's kind of the agenda on the show. Tonight with us, Dr. Brian Freelander is with us. He's a friend of the show, been on a couple times, talk about assistive tech and all the things that we have. Brian, welcome back to Home Gadget Geeks. Great that's to have great. you. Great to be back. Can you give us a, a one-minute elevator a pitch on you? What do you do? Where are you at? 
who are you kind of kind of a little bit of a background so I have a, a background I have a PhD um, in psychology I'm a psychologist but I specialize in assistive technology do a lot of consulting to um, uh, k-12 and, and k-20 um, and as well I'm a, a professor of education at the College of St Elizabeth where I teach both undergrad and graduate courses in uh, teacher education special education and assistive technology Ah, perfect. You've practiced that a few times. I think. Yeah. Nicely done. Nicely said. Nathaniel Lindley is with us. He comes at us from the other side of this equation on the hardware infrastructure, mm -hmm. kind of making those things uh, work. Nathaniel, one, welcome back. And then two, give us a little rundown on you as well. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a technology supervisor and a, a medium-sized district here in Minnesota, about 8,400 students. And my role is operations technical side and coordinator of effort. So I work with district level technicians and building technicians and teachers and integrationists and media specialists trying to kind of help keep things on the right track. So I, I get to dabble in a lot of different areas and try to learn quickly and solve problems, but I'm not a big specialist in any one area other than maybe the Google admin console. Um, so a lot of problem solving and I work with our, um, assistive technology specialists and what I'm seeing is, is this is changing a lot of stuff in technology. Yeah. So, yeah, good, good. We, we got a lot to talk about Nathaniel, both you and Mike come at this too, from a, from a parenting yeah. now homeschooling, uh, taking care of the kids. Mike, yours a little younger, I think, than, than yours, Nathaniel. Mike, yours are young enough. They're not in school yet, but right. You're taking, you're having to take care of them at home handle this with work, right? This has changed your life a little bit, right? It, it has. And we'll talk about it maybe a little bit later, but I have learned a lot. I was very gung-ho to get them in front of tech to help them. Uh, they started out with tech using Zoom, actually. They, so they go to a Montessori school and uh, that school uses uh, Zoom to do some, uh, they do their morning, you know, but their morning routine, I guess, on Zoom. And I was very excited to get them in front of tech for other reasons. And I've I've really had to back off um, in a little ways because a two and a three-year-old, it had a different effect on them a little bit with outside of the whole learning aspect with just the addictive nature to that sort of stuff. Uh, so we'll get to that. It's been very interesting because I want to obviously assist them as much best as I can as a working parent who's trying to get work done and make sure they're still getting some education at home. Uh, but it's been a little bit different with a two and three-year-old than I think it would be with older um, students. But I'm extremely interested to hear uh, what Brian and Nathaniel have to say about that because it's it's been a big change as a parent because I obviously am not in the education background. Um, I'm, a, I'm simply a, a guy working from home trying to keep his kids educated and entertained and happy uh, while also trying to get work done myself. So it's been an interesting challenge for me. Nathaniel, your kids are a little bit older, right? Yeah, so I have an elementary a fourth grader and then I have two high schoolers. Mm -hmm. How's that and going so far? It's uh, it they're doing very well, all things considered. Yeah. So you kind of have to, as a parent, you have to sort of adjust your expectations and what you see as effort and what you see as outcomes. And fortunately, their teachers are great and are really reasonable about setting expectations, making accommodations, you know, being really clear. That's the biggest thing. The teachers that set the week and say, here's very clearly what's going to happen and what's required and what's optional. And, but it's hard because the fourth grader, she needs support. She needs guidance and, um, just saying, okay, go, go do it in the corner. Isn't really effective. Yeah. It's a big difference between educating at home and working from home. And I, and I think we kind of approached it in, in some regards, we, we didn't know, nobody knew. And it was like, okay, right. maybe we can get some lessons plans and you can kind of do some school from home. And that was, you know, using Zoom or having having lesson plans that kind of work like it did in school, I think, was that equivalent to, well, I'm just going to go home and do work. The enterprise did it pretty well. We've been doing it for a while. Right. This was the real first experiment for it to happen in education. Brian, in your, in for you, talk, let's go back seven or eight weeks. How okay. did things, let's go, how did things change for you? What was it, what was the immediate impact in your role and what you're doing when everybody uh -huh. went home? Well, so I was I was actually teaching two classes online already, so not much change there. I did have one class which was hybrid, and so I had to move it over. But I, I think just generally, um, you know, school districts didn't really have enough time to really plan for this event. Um, how could they? And so teachers were thrown into this, you know, kind of baptism by fire, um, and they 
you know, they had to do the best they could. And I think that's what's happening. I mean, if there's any silver lining, it's that teachers were thrown into this and they're kind of figuring it out. But it's, you know, it's been a challenge for, you know, I, I would say for some of the teachers who are not as technological. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff that you have to figure out, you know, whether you're in Moodle or, you know, Google Classroom or, you know, Microsoft Teams, there's just a lot of a lot of stuff um, and, you know, it's the technology. It's also the, the pedagogy because that's going to change dramatically when you're in an online space as compared to when you're physically next to a student. And in my arena, I, 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 I just a, uh, you know, some things I've been thinking about, um, I, I really feel that the special ed students um, are, you know, many of them are not getting what they really need. I mean, the teachers are trying to do their best, but, you know, a lot of things are going by the wayside. And I suspect when this is all over, there'll be, I want to say, class action suits or districts will be, I think parents will come back to the districts and say, you know, my child lost so many hours of occupational therapy, one-on-one -on -one instruction for reading, how are we going to make this up in person? Um, so there, there's been a lot of, a lot of challenge, you know, a lot of challenges. And I see it because I'm teaching some graduate courses where, you know, my students are teachers themselves and like, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out how do I do this? You know, how do I, you know, you know, how do I create like a whiteboard experience? How do I, you know, break off kids in groups. So there's the technical, but there's also the pedagogy. So it's it's a challenge. I'm sure, Nathaniel, you'll see it. You're getting a lot of that too. Yeah, yeah. I, I just like, I hear everything you're saying and I see a tremendous effort to try to do their best on the part of the teachers and the Absolutely. specialists and the support yeah. staff. I yeah. They make, you know, if you're looking at the occupational therapy area, they're making videos of the of the teacher in their kitchen this is how we are making this and this and they're doing the best they can to make the content to get it to the kid and then it's it's a real team putting it together in a way that the parent at home can try to support the kid the way a para did in the classroom but it's not going to be the same right. it's not going to be as effective um but we're all in this together so it's not it's not a part it's it's not negligence on the part of the district uh, and the teachers of they're working with the best they have. And so right. I've been really impressed with the creativity and the mm -hmm. flexibility of trying to get these services delivered remotely. Um, and then uh, the, the problem I've seen is some of the teachers who think that they can cover the same content and the same structure mm -hmm. at the same pace that they're used to in person. Right. And that, that frustrates the teacher and the students and the parents and so that teaching methodology shift and mindset change is is a big part of what they're getting yeah. used to. And I think Some, three, yeah. four weeks into it, I think they're starting to get the routines. And right. and I know some of the undergrad feedback that we're getting um, at the college is that the faculty are giving the students more assignments and more writing assignments to sort of make up for that lack of time. And the students are having a very challenging time keeping up with the pace. So you're yeah. absolutely right. It's like, how do you balance out, you know, how much time and students should be spending on certain things um, so that, you know, so it's been disproportionate amount of things to do. They seem too busy, too many tasks. Um, well, I don't think anybody has the recipe for what's no. right. No. You know, some teacher might luckily hit on the right amount of stuff, too much, too little, others. And, uh, one of the challenges is is getting the kids connected, you mm -hmm. know. Um, now, in, in the special ed realm, you've got a smaller caseload that you're working with and you're connecting with families that you've already had relationships with through the right. years. But if you're looking at a high school teacher that has 120 students over different sections, trying to make sure each kid is getting to the meeting, getting into the Schoology course or whatever, right. that's a lot of effort on the teacher's part to track, too. So yeah. it, nobody has the recipe of what's the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's got to be difficult too. you know, special education students um, are very much into routine. 
and structure and the same thing, right? Like they have their routine and, and that's the routine and the structure. And I know that for a lot of them being out of that routine, when things change, like especially big changes at a time, I know like the transition to summer and transition to a lot of things can, can really throw them off. That's gotta be extremely difficult in this time. Cause you're also throwing a whole new routine. They're having to do school, but not in the normal setting that they're used to with routine. Um, but the one cool thing I have seen, and I don't know if you guys have experienced this, I've kind of seen almost, um, especially as you talk about the older kids, right? Middle middle school, high school age students almost have a different type of connection with their teacher because they're seeing them not in that normal, this is the teacher, they're at school. They almost see them as human beings too, because now you're seeing them on a webcam, just like you would your normal friends. And they're they're at their home. Yes, they're at their home. Their <laughs> dog is barking, just like, you know, their kids are running up and, and they're having to deal with that too. Um, I've, I've heard from a lot of them that, uh, a lot of parents, I will say that their kids almost talk about their teachers in a different regard now. Now it's more of them as a human being instead of just them as a teacher. And I remember as a kid, that was the weirdest thing is anytime I saw my teacher outside of school, like at the grocery store, you're right. like, oh, this is this is weird. Like this is out of the this is out of the element. You're my teacher. I shouldn't, you know, this is kind of weird. But now I think that whole dynamic has changed. Is that for the better or for the worse? I see it as a good thing, but maybe it's maybe it's not. Maybe the, there's a respect level there that needs to be maintained where you know they are the teacher, you're the student. Is that harder to maintain when you're doing digital classes? I think there's both. So I've seen examples where uh, for my daughter, for example, her teacher is so authentic. She's trying to give a video instruction, you know, a screencast or just a video direction and her cats are climbing on her and, you know, she's doing this and it makes her feel like this is a real person who's doing the best they can in their situation. So I'm, I'm in a situation like that. So it helps the kids relate. Um, I think the other point is sometimes it's a little too casual. So I heard a story of a high school teacher. One of the students wasn't connecting regularly and they're missing out. So they reached out directly and got a Google meet video one-on-one -on -one with this student. The student showed up without a shirt, you know, Hey, how's it going, Nathaniel? What's up? And the teacher's like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Mr. Lindley. Go put a shirt on, come back when you're ready to be a student. Like mm -hmm. we don't have this kind of relationship. So it's, yeah. it, you, you get that. But what I'm also afraid of is the kids who um, don't have a quiet space in their room or yeah. house. They don't have the right uh, technology to connect or their internet is less than or none. And that's where it's much, much harder for them to keep up. And mm -hmm. so that, that um, inequity that we already see in schools in the classroom is only going to get wider and, uh, and harder to yeah. bridge. Yeah, the other the other issue that we're we're seeing is uh, especially working with young you know young adults or adults is you know increase in you know depression and suicide and also you know faculty that may be picking up on any kind of domestic or physical abuse and so there are real issues as we all are working and and some of these young adults are working in very small you know environment you know they're, they're their apartments are very small. They're, you know, could be two or three kids and a mother and a father and a grandmother. And so it's it's a challenge. Um, it's well, it's a challenge for them to get their work done. In some cases, some of the students don't even have the technology in their house, which is an issue not only here but across the United States. They may not have really good Wi-Fi. Um, so that's been an issue where they may not have they may be a lot of the college students don't have a computer, even a Chromebook, they may be relying on their, you know, smartphone. And sometimes it doesn't work for when you're doing online learning. And so we've had to provide, you know, uh, computers and laptops for students. So, um, yeah. you know, we, we yeah. have, you know, as faculty, we need to be vigilant because we're coming into people's homes now. And there's a lot of other factors that are playing a part in whether students are successful or not, or picking up on mental health issues as well. Yeah, I, uh, we took for granted that our teachers all had good internet at their house. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then quickly we discovered who didn't and who, you know. Right. And like I'm trying to connect to my husband's phone through a hotspot and trying to do a Zoom meeting with my kids. And it's like, oh, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's well, a they may have had internet. It just may not have been enough internet. Right. Right. So I I've mean, done a so, lot of consulting in the last right. couple of weeks for neighbors and friends who are like, oh, it's not working. What, what should I do? Should I switch right. providers? Should I get a new router? Fortunately, in our area, the ISPs, we have CenturyLink and Xfinity have been very fast, very quick to respond and put in new installs or fix or upgrade. 
So within a week or so, most of the people I've worked with have gotten their okay. home internet because I've got five people in the house all trying to teach and take class, which yeah. is not normal. Right. Um, Brian, you teach graduate level. Is that? Yeah. And, uh, and undergrad and, and undergrad. Yeah. And so do you feel like when oh, you, you do it online to start with, did you Most, write yeah. mostly online? Mostly. Did it anything change? I mean, like it would, you would think on the surface, you go like, oh yeah, it's the same thing, but is it, has it been, it's, or has it been a little different? It's, it's not. And I've actually, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty flexible instructor. I actually changed my curriculum a bit to give to give the my students who are teachers what they needed because some of them didn't know what what to do or didn't have the tools so i try to incorporate more practical things that they can do with their students um you know as, as they were providing instruction you know because uh, this this happened really fast they may some of the some of the teachers may have had a day or two to kind of plan and you know, get into it, but uh, yeah. you know they they didn't they didn't have enough training, you know, to really do it as effectively as they wanted. So I kind of shifted my instruction to you know talk about different apps and strategies and to give them some new tools that they can use with their students. Yeah, I I, I go ahead. Go ahead, oh, I was just gonna say that's what. My, so my wife is a uh, is a professor too at the local university here, and she teaches uh, graduate occupational therapy students. Oh, okay. And um, she she really said, you know, because so she came into this though she just got into this with probably within the last year or two as an adjunct professor, and so she's right. really fresh, right? So she yeah. doesn't come in with any. Uh, past way of doing it, but she said even her having to shift, she found that more engaging almost um, Socratic method of teaching, right? Having them like question, answer, having them present. She, I, I was so shocked. Like she would be teaching and I know she would be teaching. She's on right. her laptop and she's not talking very much. She's like, no, I had each student come and present on a certain topic and just finding different ways to keep them just even that much more engaged. Right. She goes, cause they're going from having just my class online to all of their classes online. Yeah. She goes, so before mm -hmm. it wasn't that hard to keep their attention, mm -hmm. right? You know, right. they they're used to this. Here, here's my one class this week. I gotta focus online. Now it's gosh, I've been sitting in front of this computer all day. Um, right. I gotta do something different. And I I've just I've I, I've been in kind of awe watching that and like, oh man, it's just so different. And then seeing how the kids respond. I asked her, I'm like, okay, so I see all the pranks everyone's playing. Like, did your kids play any pranks on you? And she goes, no, she even told him at the end. So her class just ended. She goes, you know, I'm kind of disappointed. You guys didn't pull any funny pranks. You know, I, I expected better of you. And uh, they all got a good laugh out of that. But um, <laughs> it's it's been a very interesting time. I because what was curious to me is that she's just so new to this and she even had to change her ways and she's only been doing it for two years. Um, right, and yeah. she's done uh, one in she does one in class in person and then one online. And the difference between the two was was pretty drastic. Yeah. And well, that's what the older that's what the oldest students you can get, right? Graduate students are, I mean, that's that's they're they're adults. You're you're teaching right. adults. Um so obviously way different than teaching any any other kids, right. but uh yeah. they, you know, because some of these kids had kids. So right. these guys I we mean, think of as kids, they they're dealing with stuff at home too. Right. Just I mean, different could, struggles. I mean, I could have stuck, you know, directly to the syllabus, but I don't think I would have given them what they really needed now. And I, I think that yeah, that's yeah. the difference. Yeah. Yes, that, that's, a, that's a good way to put it. Sticking to the syllabus wasn't going to work. Uh, no, no that, anyone so. who tried to do that is just met with disappointment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just. I, I guess that was my point uh, to you, Brian. Was was you know even though you were already online and and, and it yeah. would seem that okay we can just kind of continue because we're already doing this online learning for, for, for in a in the world that was connected in a different way all of a sudden changes when it's online yeah. learning and everything behind them has changed yes i think the teachers uh, nathaniel it what what you've witnessed is teaching was one thing but when the teaching changed to being home and then we added in the there's also a spouse there and there's also dogs i, I can't believe how many dogs uh, get get in the you know get get in the camera but that whole the whole pressure changed, right? And and so it, it kind of threw everything off. Let me ask the two of you: um, have have best practices been starting to filter their way to the top? And is anybody is anybody capturing these things? Like, you, yeah, we're almost done with the school year for the most part. At least here in the United States, we're finishing up. Most people finish up in May, in sometime in May. Right. We're going to go into summer, right? Is anybody capturing? Do you guys feel like there's a system to capture these best practices? If we have to do this again in the fall, are we going to be in the same boat, Brian? Are you seeing anything along those lines? 
I'm sure I'm, I'm sure it is being done or teachers are reflecting on it. Um, I mean, I, I know I reflect on what I do and hopefully can bring that into the next um, course. It's been, I mean, it's been a lot. I mean, I, I mean, it's been all kinds of communities that have, you know, come up, uh, you know, helping teachers with this, um, you know, dilemma of how to teach online. So I think they're being they're being captured on Twitter, being captured in Facebook groups, you know, being captured. I just don't, you know, it would depend, I guess, on the local school district. Yeah. yeah. Well, and capture. that was kind of my to follow up. My question was more right. of, OK, so how much of this stuff that teachers are doing? Talking about best practices, right. how much of this is directed by the district? Like, hey, here's what you should be doing. Here's the tech you should be using. Here's how you should present it, and how much of it is really just left up to uh, figure it out and, and do the best thing possible. Like, is there a mix there? How many of them are providing? Like, is the tech just use Zoom, use this? Here's your credentials, or are they kind of left to decide how they want to do it? Well, there's there's different two things that you're asking about. One is the teaching strategy and the pedagogy of how do your structure your delivery and your content and your pacing and your scope. And one is what tools do you use to do it? So mm -hmm. my area is much more in the tools part of it. Whereas Brian works more in the pedagogy and the styles and, and the tech also, because that's his area, but some things are organically growing in terms of what works and doesn't work. So we found in our high school, especially there's a mix of, um, they have to have a mix of what we're calling synchronous and asynchronous learning. Mm -hmm. So it is not going to be successful if you say, okay, from nine to nine 45, I have my English class and nine 55 to 10 45. I have science. And I just sit and watch a zoom lecture, you know, hour after hour, that's not going to work at all. So the teachers are really finding ways to deliver some content asynchronous, watch this, do this worksheet, read a thing, get some feedback in the, you know, LMS, the Schoology or the Moodle form. Then this day, we're going to have an hour session together to discuss it. And I'm seeing breakout groups. We're not going to get the whole 30 kids together, 20 kids. We're going to do groups of five. And here's your schedule. So like my daughter may have a morning meeting at eight, but then on Tuesday, she has a small group work at 930, which is four kids. So the teacher can really listen to the four children at a time. So it's it's really a mix that way. But in terms of best practices and things, um, the teacher's are working together to figure out what's working. And so one thing that's actually happened tomorrow um, is a bunch of teachers in the Minnesota area, higher ed and K-12 are doing an online summit, the Minnesota Distance Learning Summit, mm -hmm. and it's all free sessions, no registration, no sponsors, just pick a topic, join the Meet or the Zoom and talk with each other. And so I, I'll put that link in the chat Okay. It's an opportunity for districts that are smaller or not as connected to, you know, a metro area or a PLN mm -hmm. to to hear from each other. Oh, I use this app. Oh, I could I could learn some few things that makes using this particular tool better or right. a strategy that works. So for I know there's other teachers and educators in the chat, but they're everyone's welcome to join those. And it's it's a community. The one thing I like about working in education is there's not the competitive territorial nature of it. So if I'm doing something well, I'm going to tell everyone about it. And then hopefully down the road, I'll have a question and they'll help me. You know, it's much more of a share that oh, right. help me out. I have a problem and not yeah, that, you can't yeah. know my secrets because I'm really good at this. Yeah. So it sounds like tomorrow's almost like an ed camp kind of activity online. Yeah. Well, the governor of Minnesota, uh, when he said uh, last week that schools would not reopen before or the end of the year. So we were all waiting for him to say it. He said it. it and he's done a great job of being measured and clear. And uh, this is why, this is how, yeah. you know. So when he said it's done, he declared that tomorrow, May 1st and Monday, the 4th, are no student school days oh, okay. across the state, which gave right. the teachers two days to breathe, to regroup right. and to plan out the rest of the four weeks, five weeks of the school year. So a lot of them are taking that time of, of not having to be in front of a class or do things to kind of uh, take a rest and regroup because they've got all of May to <laughs> keep going. Yeah, we, um, our governor Murphy here in um, New Jersey hasn't yet said that, but um, I suspect he, you know, he just, he does, it's a little early cause we go through the middle of June. So I think he's just kind of 
stringing it out just a little bit longer, <laughs> but I don't think we'll go back. I do not think we'll go back. It seems like some states are definitely handling it better than others. Nathaniel, it's so funny that you're also from Minnesota. My sister's up there studying. Um, she's in the Minneapolis area, and uh, she's you know learning to be a Montessori teacher. So she's I, she was actually just getting ready to start doing her rotations around the schools, and she was just telling me everything that the governor and everyone has done up there or statewide. I mean, they have just been on top of the game, it seems like, from day one, at least in terms of having a directive, having a direction, getting everyone – in solidarity, right? Like we're all doing this. This is the direction we're going. Is that true? I mean, has that been, it's from an outsider's perspective, from someone from a different state, it feels like you guys have been on top of day one. I think so. I think, um, it, it, I think it's the best it can be. It's not great The you know, when we were told originally in mid March, when they said, okay, schools are closing, it was like, whoa, wait. And like someone said earlier, it was like a fire drill. What do we need to get out of the building so that we can get it into the home? So sixth through 12th grade, they had take home devices, you know, so that was less of a challenge is K5, all the devices they use are in the building. So how do we in an organized manner, get these devices out of the building to the families who needs them, who doesn't need them, what type it is, is it going to work? Do we check it out? You know, so that was chaotic those first few days. And then we've been, my tech department's been playing catch up ever since checking out devices for those who thought, you know, I thought my kid could go by using a Kindle, but it's not working with the app, right? And now I think I need an iPad. Okay, we're going to get an iPad because you're in this, you know, so we've been doing five to 10 a day of checkouts. So families will do a curbside drive up, check out a device you know, a Chromebook or an iPad. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we actually do deliveries for families that can't get to the building to pick one up. But wow. that's, that's a huge challenge. Like it, you can't expect the kids to do online learning and work without a device and mom's phone isn't going to cut it. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, we're a gadget show, you know, normally we're, we're talking about gadgets, right? That's what we're doing. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask both of you and Nathaniel, you've kind of alluded to this, but now that we know what we know, mm -hmm. yeah, Right. We've been doing this for eight weeks, let's say, and, and we, we know a few things. We think about the technology that's out there. What could we be doing different or, or, or what have you seen work differently or well or better or changed with a gadget or with the, just a piece of hardware or the technology? Let me give you an example, just so you kind of know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Twice, uh, uh, Tony brought it up in the chat room. And I've heard this, I think, on Saturday mornings, Ask the Podcast Coach, when I do that show, one of the, um, somebody had said, the school district has put Wi-Fi hotspots on their buses and they're driving their buses out during the day, running the, to areas where the, the internet is not good and, and helping assisting students by turning on those hotspots so students can then at least have some Wi-Fi where in neighborhoods where they, in poor neighborhoods where they may not have it at all, right? And that's been a way of kind of adapting, getting on a mobile, you know, that's kind of the Elon Musk model in some ways. It's super low yeah. tech, but it's what, it's, it's what the district had. Like we have buses, we have bus drivers, we have Wi-Fi hotspots. How do we, how do we, how do we make that kind of work? Like it was different. Have you guys had seen any examples or thought through this at all to say, Hey, in this new world a little bit, we're going to talk about the fall here in a second, as we think about right. just thinking ahead to the future, but you seen any of those kinds of things change? I think outstate has done more of the bus central location. Uh, the more rural cities where there's not a public library, there's not other resources. We're in a suburb and there's resources around that have Wi-Fi accessible. Um, Xfinity has made their, you know, if you go around and you see Xfinity Wi-Fi, they've made that free. You don't have to have a Comcast Xfinity account to use that. So your neighbor may have it and you can use theirs. Um, but we've done a lot of hotspot checkouts. Um the, and what's so surprising is just the families that we thought we had taken care of during the year. We had a huge increase in requests once distance learning started. Um, but yeah, some some out state places have done that. Um, I know St. Paul, which is a big district in our state. I think they checked out something like 17,000 hotspots, wow. like wow. just tons. And that's yeah. a dense, you know, more urban yeah. area. But if you know, if you've got several people in the family all trying to connect, 
um, it's hard to do that. So that's the the biggest challenge really is the internet access from my point of view. And we're really lucky. I'm in a, a metro that has two choices, you know, that if you can pay for it, but you don't even have those choices if you go farther out state. So that's the biggest challenge okay. Okay. from my point of view. Brian, anything have you seen? No, I mean, I heard? Think, uh, Comcast Xfinity has stepped up to the plate and turned those hotspots on for students to take advantage of if it's in that building or, um, but I haven't really seen, I haven't really seen anything else or heard of anything else. Uh, into, but I mean, I know this talk amongst the IT at the college, you know, for purchasing hotspots to be able to give to students who may not have, yeah. you know, the connectivity at home. That's, that's, it, it is an issue. Some Nathaniel. districts have resorted to buying iPhone sevens with hotspot capability because they can't oh, yeah. get hotspots. You can't, right. you know, three right. week wait. Refurbs, right? Yeah. Refurbs on those. Yeah. Then there's plenty just, in the market. Just put a data plan yeah. on. No, it's a good, see, I love that ingenuity. Like mm -hmm. thinking, be thinking outside of the box, Nathaniel, you're on the hardware side. What's held up so far and what hasn't you, you guys, I think your Chromebooks. Yeah. You, you were talking about Kindles, iPads are out there. What's, is there, are you seeing any trends of things that are doing better than others or some things that aren't doing well at all? What have you learned from well, hardware? We're, big, we're a big Chromebook district, you know? And so one of the things I've always liked about it and talked about is the uh, security and the control of the experience. So all the students that have district Chromebooks checked out, I can go ahead and say, make sure the camera and the microphone are always allowed on meet.google.com. So then we don't have to take all the support calls saying, I can't get my camera to work because it didn't go up to the little window and click allow and stuff. So oh, I have the ability to kind of keep the experience consistent and reliable. They're always logged into the right account. They're always getting the updates. You know, the iPads have been good, but it's sort of hit and miss because if you have an older one, it doesn't support iOS 13 and then it can't run this app. And then you have privacy settings. They're generally used in our younger students where they're uh, attending through Seesaw and some other controlled experiences. Um, but the, you know, I've always said the Chromebooks have been a great tool for us. Um, as for the teachers, they, they use a variety of things, um, mostly Windows laptops, especially in secondary because they're jumping between different things. But then a lot of our staff, we sent them home with Chromebooks so that they can keep up with uh, the tools and connections. Yeah. At, the, at the college level, it's all, you know, we're pretty much, um, I mean, some of the faculty issued window, Windows laptops, but, you know, most of the faculty have Macs, mix of Windows, you know, so they're using whatever they, they own individually. Yeah. But the, um, it's, you know, the, again, some of the students come from, uh, you know, urban areas and where they can't afford high-end computers. Some are coming from Chromebooks, but like I said, a lot of them rely on their smartphone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the times where, uh, you know, you think about the school buses and that are parked around mm -hmm. as a tech guy. I'm like, okay, do I order a unify an extra unify access point and post to my <laughs> next door that my front yard is a free Wi-Fi zone, right? Good mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. I put out some lawn chairs some tables and uh, anyone who for some reason in our neighborhood doesn't have internet, you know, come hang out in our front yard and uh, you can at least have access to the internet. And I got, you know, I got more than enough speed here that I don't use. Um, they could definitely you know, utilize some of it. And, uh, and of course, yeah. then the tech fun side is okay. Playing with like bandwidth it, caps it was, and doing all the fun stuff yeah. on the side. It was, it was kind of interesting. I, um, I, I, I was, I was approached to try this platform that actually used um, a smartphone. Uh, the CEO approached me and he actually developed a platform using, you know, not even smartphones, just because he was doing a lot of work in Africa and they needed to move information and concepts and ideas. And so he developed a platform to basically, you know, do online learning through texting. And so hmm. he gave me access to it. It was kind of, it was kind of interesting because what would happen, you, you know, me as the professor instructor, I set up all the information and then every morning at 10 o'clock, you'd get a chunk of information that I developed, my students would get, and then they'd be able to respond in the text message and you could put a link and a graphic. So it was kind of interesting. My, some of my students enjoyed that, the fact that it was different and that it was presented every day at that time, they could expect you know, a chunk of information. And it's a more of a lightweight delivery. You know, text message, exactly. Exactly. can work on very limited cellular connection. Yeah, That's so they, 
company is what's the company name? Um, let me see if I can get that. Um, it's called Arist, A R I S T. That's the company name. Um, and I, I believe they are giving schools the opportunities to, you know, kick the tires um, to use it. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Another perspective on doing some online learning, but using texting. Let, let me ask you guys this question as we think about the fall, because I think there's a lot of questions and I'm not going to ask you, are we going back or not? Because nobody knows <laughs> at this point. Right. We, we don't know. Um, but as we think about say we go in, I mean, if we go into a fall and school's back to normal, what do you think changes or does anything change? So let's, let's cover that scenario first. We get back to fall. We're back in school. Kids are coming. It's, it's just like it was before. Nathaniel, does your world, is your world different for, for some reason? Or do you guys go back to, do you kind of just go back to normal? Uh, it's, it's hard to predict. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. You said the pre-show. You, know, uh, you guys have gone through all the iterations. It's kind of why I'm asking this question. Yeah, no, bit, like, we're yeah. really trying to dream up. Okay, if this happens, this is how we need to approach mm -hmm. it. And if you know, situation A, B, and yeah. C. And right now, my my gut is telling me it's going to be different, even if it can be everyone. If we can have all the students and teachers back in the classroom as normal in September, which I don't expect, it's going to feel different. Yeah. One of the things I'm looking forward to is a recognition on everyone's part, the parents, the students, and the teachers of the value and the benefit of being in a classroom with a teacher. <laughs> so prior to this, we were getting a lot of feedback of like, well, if I can do uh, flipped education and I can deliver a video to my kids and they can watch these YouTubes and send me comments. Why do we need to be in the class? So there was a lot of that discussion the last several years. <laughs> well, now we're finding out and yeah. I'm hoping that that really makes the benefit of school and relationships and being together positive, mm -hmm. you know, recognized and then valued. My guess is that we're going to have a hybrid. We're going to have some days, where we don't have students or we're going to have some students on one day and some students on another day, it's going to be really hard on the teachers because they're going to have to keep growing and changing. And so if a teacher has been set on, well, I always do it in this way and I do it in this order and I do this unit, it, they're going to have to adjust. I just can't imagine it's going to be business as usual in September, maybe in two years it might be. But Yeah. So, I mean, right now we're like, getting ready to do like boot camps to make sure faculty could be up and running in a heartbeat. Um, right now, all the summer classes are online. Definitely. We don't know what's happening with the fall. And so, you know, our IT people are doing tremendous amount of training on using Moodle and how to organize it and, and also the pedagogy that goes along with it. So, uh, and, and I imagine that, you know, there be, might be some reflection, too, where we can begin to take some of the programs that we, you know, typically do on campus and move it all online, which then makes it, it gives other students even across the st different states the opportunity to register for courses um, as, you know, as well. But it's kind of interesting because a lot of students come to our campus because they want that classroom experience and interaction with the faculty. So if you gave them the option, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though it's easier for many of them, you know, to go online, they would say, I'd rather come to class every week and interact with you and the other students in the class. Yeah. I'm curious, Brian, a little more of your, your familiarity with higher ed. Everyone took the end of the year. It was like, okay, this is, we just got to get through it. Right. You know, and what I've been hearing is that finals and the way they're delivered in just in the, in the circles I'm in has been haphazard. So some professors are like, you got 24 hours. Here's the information. It's an ungoogleable test. Like using right. Google doesn't help you show me right. your knowledge right. and have been flexible. Others have said, here's the two hour window that it has to be done. You can only do it in this time in this way. And that's it. And the impact of that is that if all the kids from a university or college are spread out, if I'm in a time zone that's close, it's probably convenient. If I'm in Hawaii 
or Singapore and I'm trying to attend my international class and right. I'm in a 12 hour difference. So higher ed is going through the same struggle. I, I would presume of yeah, and how do we deliver and what's quality and what's not quality. Yeah. And what's so, I mean, there are, you know, like quality mat, like we're a member of quality matters um, for online yeah. training and things of that sort. But I mean, we haven't done this yet, but I'm sure we're going to look at, you know, there are third parties that are basic, basically um, companies that will basically proctor examinations online and certify that mm -hmm. you were the one who took the test, whether they have a webcam watching you, supervising you. Um, so there are a couple of companies that will, um, you know, do that um, proctoring, um, you know, for high stakes, either exams or testing. So we, we are beginning to look at that, you know, for final exams. We, we have some nationally accredited programs like physician assistants. And so when you do finals and things like that, you want to make sure that, you know, Jim yeah. Jones is taking the test and they, they're not calling in their brother who's a physician and everything else, you know. So that, that I'm sure that's in the future. Uh, high stakes. Well. Yeah, high stakes testing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, years ago I did some certification on Adobe products and I had to basically, you know, take my watch, leave my smartphone, put it in the locker, you know, and you know, walk in, you know, and they took a picture of you, you know. So I think it's gonna ha it's definitely gonna happen online too, where these companies are gonna crop up that do uh, pr you know, you know, distance proctoring and sort and certifying. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm I'm very curious to see what the enrollment looks like at colleges and universities in the fall. Mm -hmm. so I, I, if I'm a graduating senior yeah. and yeah. I was going to go to a school in residential, but I don't know if they're really going to have residents. So do I take a gap year? Do I try to do online? Do I risk it? Or yeah. You go to an online school that's known for its online. Like, right. Uh, right. Yeah. So All Phoenix. Sudden, uh, there's a flood. <laughs> well, or there's a flood. Governor. Governor University, there's right. governor, there's New Hampshire. New Hampshire, those, yeah. yeah. I mean, like if I can go to a school that has a reputation as a really good online school, yeah, and I and I'll transfer my credits, there could be a rush this fall of my daughter who's gonna be a senior next year. Right. Uh, right. So we're we're in this boat. Right. And she's she's definitely committed to the school because of the program that's there. So she doesn't really want to go anywhere else. She can finish online if she has to. She's got some questions about it as well. She has a photography class that she's got to figure like, you know, she got to figure out. She's like, dad, I don't like, I would have checked out a camera from this. I'm like, we'll get you a camera. It's not like, it's not that big right. of a deal. But she did mention to me, one of her friends said to her, Hey, if we go hundred percent online in the fall, I'm going to fill in the blank or whatever the school was because they have a better online program. They'll accept our credits. And yeah. why would I not finish out in a school that's better mm -hmm. at it than her we school? Yeah, we have a we have a college called Edison College and everything is online and you can also put together your own bachelor's degree. They give you credits for life experience and they're doing tremendous amount of marketing now and advertising. I suspect that um, enrollment will be down anywhere from 10 to 20 percent in the fall. And just like you said, I would say that, you know, a lot of students will take a gap year or they'll do, you know, they'll, do, they'll take some online courses at a community or junior college and see what happens the following yeah. year. Why, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they look and see, okay, I'm paying $400 a credit hour at Oklahoma State. Right. I can go to Shawnee, uh, you know, uh, Shawnee Community College at $75. Right. And take my basic, you know, writing class or chemistry, yeah. you know, something right. Like that. And before that didn't make any sense because I was on campus already, right. and right, I, right and you just wouldn't do that. But but today, all of a sudden, that's a real, that's kind of a real environment. Nathaniel, I, I'm I'm gonna. It sparked off what something you said in the pre-show to me of just about this idea mm -hmm. of all these different scenarios. I'm gonna make this statement. I just want you guys to kind of respond to it. One of the things I think it's a shame is we go into the fall and it's uncertain. And, and maybe it's going to be a hybrid. You said, you know, maybe some students won't even want to come back. So we open up the school and there's parents who are like, yeah, I don't really want to send my kids, to be honest. And we have some parents who are like, go. Yeah. yeah some parents <laughs> who are like, stay. Right. I think we miss a real opportunity this fall. All we've made some, we've made some progress in this idea of kind of emergency based learning. Like this is what we're in, right? We're yeah. in a, we're in a flat out emergency. It's not a snow day. It's not even an extended mm -hmm. snow day. Like we're in a full pandemic emergency. I think it'd be a shame if we didn't use the fall as another opportunity to try again. 
like regroup. What did we learn? What worked? What didn't get this, get the, to teach her some education, allow the districts to retool a little bit and then say, okay, do over. Let's go into the fall knowing we've got these kinds of that, that this is going to be a possibility. How would we do it again? Cause I don't think this is going to be the last time something like this is going to happen. And I think we'd be crazy not to learn from this and try it again. Nathaniel, you're in the trenches. How do you respond to that statement? Well, I, I'm curious you know, other people's opinion. But if I, if I step way back and if I ran the zoo, which is a great Dr. Seuss book, (laughs) but if I ran the zoo, one of the complaints over the years has always been, Oh, the schedule. Oh, the calendar. I wish it could be more flexible. I wish we could have more time for kids that need this support and, you know, accelerate over here. And I wish it wasn't always based on what your age was and which grade or which class you were, were. So I wish it was more flexible so that the kids who are accelerated, but younger can take classes with older students. And, you know, so that's always been a, um, a frustration of the structure of a typical K-12 institution. Yeah. So if that's been our frustration and we've just, the train went off the tracks four weeks ago, maybe this is an opportunity to redesign what our typical K-12 institution looks like. So maybe the calendar is not so important. We're maybe not stuck to an agrarian September to June calendar for school. Maybe we're not stuck to a six, seven hour day. Maybe not all teachers have to be in the building every day. Maybe not all students have to be in the building every day. So that's kind of my just musing of what could it look like if you started over in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so some kids actually have benefited from this distance learning because going to class was the challenge for them. Mm -hmm. Being in a class with 20 some kids was the anxiety producing stress. And so being able to step back and participate at their own speed and pace during the day has been a benefit for some kids. So what are we learning from that? I don't, I don't think things will change that dramatically, but uh, you know, in my dream world, that's where we would look. And you're working more towards what are your skills? What are your interests? What is the time that you can allocate you know, to do this? And how do we help the teachers be flexible enough to do that? If I was going to run the world and start over, I would say, okay, all summer students are not in class, but the teachers are. Give the teachers a paid summer and give them time to develop flexible curriculum, delivery, pacing, in the anticipation that in the fall, it will be some mix of instruction. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. obviously I, that's gonna meet with a lot of resistance, but that's kind of like, mm-hmm. if I could dream up what it would look like, that's one of my ideas. Right. Yeah, I've always thought too, that it should be a 12 month position with like maybe three weeks off or something like that. So you could do that professional development that needs to be done. I mean, you know, things are changing so, I mean, so quickly, especially in technology. It is just like, when you, when I think about, well, I've been, I've been in, you know, in education 30 years. When you think about the you know technology I had 30 years ago and what I can do now, it, it's, it, it's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. We couldn't have done this. We couldn't have uh, done what we've done this year or this okay. month as well, even five, 10 years ago, this would have been impossible. Impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I think we actually kind of dodged a little bit of a bullet there. I was, I was kind of thinking, you know, that same thing five or 10 years ago, what a disaster <laughs> this, this could have potentially. And I mean, it's, it's been difficult. I, I, I don't want to make any right. light of it. It has been really yeah. difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. Right. Has. But, yeah. but, but it has been manageable. And the fact that it's funny, we've been, you know, we've been podcasting now, uh, coming up in December, Home Gadget Geeks is 10 years old. Mm-hmm. And so we've been doing a, a, this kind of learning, this podcasting, this t- community learning. It, it could be a class. We could teach a right. class this way. Many, many do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we've been doing it for 10 years. Uh, we're in an environment now where teachers are beginning to think, oh, you know, if I ran my class like a podcast and if I had, <laughs> groups, if I had discussion groups, and if I allowed them, if I taught it once and allowed them to watch it in or listen to it, whatever works for them in a time that fits. And then we have times where we meet together, meetups. And, you know, all of a sudden, like our podcast infrastructure 
starts looking a little like a little interesting. You start kind of going, and it's not the perfect schoolwork, and it maybe doesn't work for high school kids all, all the way, but there's some clues to it, I think. And I think some teachers have kind of caught on like, oh, hey, wait a minute. Not just recording to YouTube and leaving it, right? That's not right. that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a a, a consistent education based, interesting conversations. Get the dialogue going. Take that to take that to a Facebook group or take that to a Discord. I mean, I, I manage eight thousand certified coaches around the world uh, every day uh, through social structures that are really education structures. Structures, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's. It's a really a great way um, kind of for them to learn. So we think fall, any other thoughts, gentlemen, on things? Uh, Nathaniel, you you had a, you, that, that was a great little, like, if I could, if I could be president speech there and, and change things, well, maybe president's too much. Maybe the disc, maybe the superintendent, but um, no, a great speech. Brian, anything you'd add? Uh, as we think about fall, anything you would add to that? That uh, oh, I, I, would, I mean, I would imagine that there will be, there should be a tremendous amount of um, you know summer development work in preparation for the fall because you know some uh, you know some some doctors are predicting that the fall could be just as bad, if not worse. And so mm -hmm. I suspect that um, a lot of effort will be put in to reflect on what worked and also. Um, to have some boot camps where teachers are refining what they're doing and figuring out what the best thing is, getting ready for the fall to be online, um, yeah. yeah, or or hybrid. You know, we might be in school for a little while and then be out of school for a while too. Yeah, we, we it's scheduled to have Chris Nessie, and this is kind of his area of expertise as we think about the ed tech space mm -hmm. and the kind of the work that he is doing. Wanted to hear from that. We'll we'll have to reschedule him and have him back on, but. But I think I heard both of you say, I mean, I think it's a summer of opportunity. I don't think the fall is a return to normal no. uh, from, from what you guys are saying. And then I think for a lot yeah. of educators, it's a step back. And, and, and hopefully this is happening at all levels, not just the, the, not just the teachers, but at the administration levels to say, okay, let's take a step back. And we've got to do some serious retooling. That may not necessarily mean sending everybody back to school, but making some tweaks, right, yeah. kind of based on what we learned. The, the other, I mean, the other issue um, we're having is that we place teachers um, in schools to be student teachers. And so how do we structure, how do we structure their activities? Because they have to put a certain number of hours in. So a lot of them were thrown into doing online instruction as student teachers. So it's something we really have to re reflect on in our curriculum is, you know, we provide, we, we get teachers set up to teach in classrooms. We now really need to think about, not think about, we need yeah. to do, we need to teach them how to teach online. And that, which is another, another thing we really need to look at. That's a great point. That's a great point that your teacher education program has got to have a, a new lens to it yes. of in and outside of class instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the challenges, okay, all these teachers are teaching from home, but what happens when they have a sick day? How do you get a sub for a distance teacher? So mm -hmm. <laughs> what we've what we've seen is a lot more collaboration. Right. So a third grade team will kind of float each other through days that are easier and harder rather than yeah. this is my set of 30 kids and mm -hmm. don't don't ever cross lines between classrooms. Yeah. See, okay, what you just said there, Nathaniel, I think is key is completely rethinking the structure. So instead, if you have three teachers who are teaching third grade, that becomes that third grade becomes a unit now, like it can. It's not divided by walls, right? It's right. It, it and and you can have now you can divide the load and have teachers sharing that. And if one needs to be out you can do that kind of smoothly because you're team teaching, right? In that, where maybe yeah. that wouldn't have worked before. When we've had that right. structure in schools before, so especially sure. in middle sure. schools, you'll see a, a house concept. Right. Um, I'm the University of Minnesota team. And this four, te four sections of seventh grade, you know, we're a team and we cross, I'm the social studies teacher and I'm the science teacher. So you have that subgroup of structure already. Yeah. It's just even more important now Right. To to share the load among the teachers and to share share their expertise. Well, and what I'd love to see, and, and especially in Chris's area where he's doing a podcast that really teaches, it highlights some of the best things that's been that's going on, some of the best tech that's happening. I really actually think that's a good model for teachers over the course of the summer. I would love to see a bunch of best practice web uh, podcasts pop up 
where yeah. teachers could subscribe, you know, take your model, take your one day model that's going on for the teachers to come and do this, this, what are you calling that? A work? It's not a work, a virtual Minnesota Nathaniel. distance learning summit. Yeah. The summit. There we go. Yep. Great name for it. Uh, to, to have these summer programs for teachers who could subscribe, you know, I just, I'd love to see a bunch of podcasters pop up from teachers who well, start sharing that, right? Is that happening? Yeah, I, what I was going to say is that I've learned a lot from you all in this podcast journey of how you get good sound and audio and you set up your space and all those little tips and tricks because now the teachers are trying to figure it out on their own and we're trying to help them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I talked about uh, earlier, I think pre-show, is that I'm trying to impress on people that are on online all day in meetings. So I'm on meetings like almost all day. And we use Microsoft Teams a lot internally. And then our students and teachers use Google Meet a lot. So we're not a Zoom district. Um, but when you're online all day, having your sound and your presentation to be as good as it can be or reasonably makes a difference for your audience more than for you. So knowing that the sound is high quality and good, it's less strain on the listener. It's less fatigue. Now, we all get tired of doing online meetings now because it's not a novelty anymore. <laughs> it's not the best way to communicate with people. So we're getting adjusted to that, but you know, helping the teachers set up with the tools they need to be um, better delivery and better communication as best as it can be, would be, would be a good technical challenge. Yeah, oh, go Do you see the school district putting the bill for some of that equipment to make the home. Well, we've already, we've already bought a lot of headsets. Okay. So we'll get, we'll get the headsets with a boom mic. Okay. okay. Which, which is certainly not the same as what we're using here right. um, with the microphone and that. And I've tried a lot of things and they're not great, but they're way better in terms of isolating the sound mm -hmm. and clarity. And they have, I've noticed a lot of the headsets have this sort of, restricted range. It's not as deep, um, but it's clear and it's easy to understand. And so we bought a lot of those and got them out to teachers. That's great. Uh, so they have that, but not everyone. Um, and then we've had a lot of laptops that have had to come back and get checked out again. And, and, mm -hmm. and so that, that's a challenge. And some teachers have their own tech they're trying to use and some of it's good and some of it's not. The interesting thing, this is if we go into the technical side, we use Google Meet a lot, which Google made freely available to schools for the summer that. with the enterprise tools with recording and analytics and large groups. They have a quality admin tool where you can look at individual meets or sessions and look at the analytics of um, how, what network congestion, what was the audio, who came in and left, who screen shared, which computers are running high CPU and low CPU. And so when I get feedback, you know, I'm trying to do Google Meet and it's just not working and the audio is breaking up, I can go into those analytics and say, okay, well, here's what I'm seeing. You, you didn't have, your computer is running at 90%. What, you've got to shut everything down and then just do the meet, you know, I right. don't know what kind of computer I have, but that's the analytics. Right. You know, so I'm able to help troubleshoot a bit, even through that tool to say, no, it doesn't look like your network. Or flip side, your network congestion is really high. Well, I was outside on my patio. I guess the Wi-Fi is <laughs> good out there. Well, okay. <laughs> so, But they've never had to do that before because right. we've taken care of it in the building. That's our job so that they don't have to worry about it. Now they're learning along with us. Well, in that sitting on the porch out on the patio is a, it's kind of a cool, sexy thing that, you know, it's like, Oh, I'm home mm -hmm. now I can do this. And then you're like, yeah, but it's having a, it, like your house isn't built for that. Like you don't have a hotspot on your, if you had a hotspot yeah. on your patio, uh, well, that would be do. perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, be, <laughs> yeah. I have one in my garage. Don't you? Yeah. Nathaniel, doesn't everyone um, have unify access points just littered across the, uh, the house. Kyle was asking, can you share the model of the headset you're using? Do you know? And yeah. then while you're uh -huh. looking that up, we, um, we use job, the jobber brand. So th these are really popular right now. They're hard to find. <laughs> Yeah. But there's a 40, yeah. Yep. So there's a 40 and a 60 series. The the 40s are, uh, I think, a, and there's a 20 series too, and you can do mono and dual on those. But I don't. When I get Mike, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this too. When I'm working with my uh, my you know my partners at work, and I, they get on and they have a terrible connection, I'm like, the very first question is, do you have a headset? 
And they know, like some of them now know I'm going to ask. So they come on, they don't come on without it. They, they, in fact, if I call them, I see them scrambling. They're like, just a second. I'm trying to get my headset on because, because I know, like, like you said, there's a fatigue factor in it. Mm -hmm. If we're doing this all, it's okay every once in a while. Right. Oh yeah. But if we're doing it all the time that way, after a full day, you get pretty tired. Mike, have you, have you run? Are you, first of all, Mike, are you using this at work? No. Are you using? Oh, I not? did. Okay. I did. And it freaked people out <laughs> every single time. Like, whoa, I feel like I'm being like interviewed, like a radio guy. Like they, they, <laughs> they, they did not like it. Um, so I actually have my blue Yeti and I have it off camera. Cause that blue Yeti picks up a great, you know, it, it can do well without being right up in your face, right, right. but it sounds better than the mic on the board. And it has a physical mute button, which is my favorite with, especially with kiddos running around. So I oh, use yeah. that and it can be below the camera. So they don't even know I'm using a, a nice mic, uh, but it sounds good to them. Um, but the other thing it's hard to fix is I think Nathaniel fixed it. So audio number one. Yeah. I mean, th- my biggest thing is we have a lot of people who um, have really bad echoes and they don't realize if all it takes is just putting in headphones. It doesn't even have to be a microphone. It's just your mic on your ki- on your computer. The way it's set up is picking up what the speakers are putting out, and uh, so that's been one. But my boss, the guy I talk with the most every single day, I probably talk to him three or four times a day via video chat, has the worst internet. And he just—I mean—he lives in San Diego, great house. For some reason, though, his Wi-Fi or wherever he's doing. And I have like sent him multiple. Like, hey, here's like a power line adapter. Maybe if you can't do anything, maybe this will just help. Or maybe this will just help. Anything, because it is so hard. And I've started calling him on the phone more often because it—I mean—by the time we have to get through an hour conversation, I have like probably said ten times. Sorry, I didn't catch that. You were cutting out. What'd you say? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch that. What'd you, what'd you say? And I'm just like, it's it just drives you nuts. There are these little things we've picked up on. And uh, if you're if you're not a tech guy or you don't know, a lot of them just don't care either. They just think, hey, everyone's dealing with these issues. But man, as the guys who know how to solve this, you just want to yeah. fix everyone's issue, right? It's, you want to. It's hard to everyone. bite your tongue. It is. It's you so know? hard to bite your. You I agree. Because like, you're like, uh, can I just step in for a second, guys? Can we just pause? If Listen, that person my, puts in headphones and if that person turns off Wi-Fi and plugs yeah. the internet cord, we will have a much more productive meeting. My, right? my tongue hurts from, well, I, I'm not going to bite it anymore. I just tell people, get your, put your headset on, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and, and if we're going to have this conversation, turn your camera on because I want to see you. And, you know, there's some that I, I, there's some of like, oh, you know, I, I'm like, hey, is your camera working today? Like, you know, that's kind of how I start, right? <laughs> And they're like, oh, I didn't really, I'm like, I don't actually, I don't really care what you look like. I want to see your eyes. So like, let's, so can you turn your camera on for me? It, it hurts me when I can't, when I'm talking to you and I can't see you. And very rarely does that not get them. Usually they're like, okay. And they'll turn it on and they'll be in a sweatshirt or something. You're like, look, I I don't care about any of those things. I want to see your face because I'm reading your facial expressions. It's how I know when to talk and when not to interrupt and, when I'm, when the point is coming across and you're agreeing with me, cause I see it in your eyes. Mm-hmm. And if I can't see it in your eyes, I can't, it, I'm, I'm not as effective. Right, right. And so, yeah. So a lot of people now uh, are coming. It's, it's taking time. I think that's the point too, with, mm-hmm. with the kids, the students, the teachers. I think if we go back in the fall in a similar environment, there's going to be a lot of lessons learned and it's, we're not going to go all the way back. It's not like we're going to go, all the way back to March and kind of have to start over. There'll be some lessons learned and some teachers will be like, okay, here's, I, I, I you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, <laughs> shame on me. And, <laughs> and we're going to get this thing right this time. Nathaniel, do you sense that from some of the teachers that you work with? Like there's a, I know they're in, they're just in crisis mode at the moment, but do you think they'll, this a summer off and some retooling will be helpful? I think so. I think a lot of them, they've been kind of, jump started on a lot of the tools that they've been able to say, I don't, I don't need to learn that yet. Cause I'm still got my kids in the class. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of them are like, Oh, okay. I'm going to get on board and this is going to, you know, Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Or that's kind of cool. And you know, a lot of our teachers, when I'm meeting with them or media specialists, they really, really miss their kids. Yeah. They miss their kids and they're afraid if, if we come back and we'll still have to social distance they're you know, they're like, how am I going to not be in contact with my students, especially in the younger elementary? So it it's hard for them, but I think they're learning ways to get feedback. They're being authentic with their students, which encourages the students to be authentic. 
You know, when my daughter did her first lunch bunch meeting with her class and they all had their picnic lunch kind of thing and they were all checked in online and they could see each other and the teacher led them through Simon Says. So that helped learn how to mute and when to listen. So with the younger kids, you got to, the, the back and forth, the dialogue is not as natural. Right. So we, we step on each other's toes here and we're adults, but <laughs> you know, that first time they were so excited to see their friends. Yeah. So yeah. my two and three year old went through that exact same thing. The first time they got on a zoom meeting, uh, it was just pure chaos. I imagine a bunch of two and three year olds. Yeah all yelling and then there's oh, one of the three-year-olds saying everyone's yelling it's too loud it's too loud and he's freaking out because everyone's just talking over yeah. themselves but they actually after about the so they did it every they do it every day right 10 o'clock yeah. um log in we'll do circle time we'll do our thing and they got it down to a pretty good cadence either that or the parents learned they needed to step in and mute the microphone but i think the kids actually started to learn it a little bit and that's young kids but you know what was shocking to me my kids didn't bat an eye at the fact that they were doing their class on zoom i mean because they facetime their grandparents they facetime aunts and uncles their cousins i mean my two and three year old that is how they see their people and they're so used to it and they I, they could probably run my wife and i's phone to do a facetime to call i actually got them amazon tablets with the free the kids version and they asked why can't like i want to facetime bop and i'm like well this actually this device doesn't do that uh with free time it's locked down and, the, and they're like confused like no, like devices, video call. That's what these do. I don't yeah, know what why. Good is this? What good is this? Dad, you got me a defunct product. Return this to get me an iPad, please. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it's very interesting how different age groups have adopted to whether this is weird, whether this is normal, I mean, and how it works. Um, but, you know, I'm interested, Brian, in, in your psychology side of things. Real quick, I was talking about my two and three-year-old. And I did get them the Amazon, you know, kids tablet, right? right. Fully locked down. You can control the amount of time. And uh, that's really the first piece of tech. I'm a huge techie. My wife is the complete opposite. Um, right. And we uh, we would much prefer our kids play outside in the dirt and get dirty all day. And that's kind of the Montessori method too, right? Montessori method is more play with your hands, play with mm-hmm. wood objects. Yeah. That's the real, style. Real, real stuff. Real exactly. Real stuff. stuff. Well, and so, um, I, but they're great with technology and they have an interest in it. So I, I actually gave it to them. And it was amazing how fast uh, they just, I mean, you took that thing away and it was like you were taking away their livelihood and the hour. Cause I was like, Oh, this is great. It has a timer built in so I can set it daily max. It hit that hour and it locked them out. And you would have thought the world was coming to an end. And I've never seen that, that reaction from them. Like we've had to bring them in from outside, right? Hey, time to stop playing outside, come inside time to have dinner time. And their transitions as we call them and uh, have been great. Uh, with technology, though, completely different. Is there a is there a difference? I mean, is there an age where they handle that differently? I mean, obviously, I, I think there probably is, but is that just no? <laughs> no. Is it is it just technology in general? But I'm I was so confused why I can pull them from any other activity, and they can be fine. I can pull them from the ball pit at Burger King, right? Like the ultimate kids play gym. I can pull them from that, and they 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 whine and no, I wanted to stay, but they don't throw it. I mean, and this was just I mean, meltdown I mean, mode. If you look at, I mean, look at some of the research. I mean, I think, you know, the technology really um, gets their like, you know, endorphins and it puts the brain, it sets the brain in a certain mode that it, it's very, re, you know, it's very reinforcing. Um, and that's why, you know, you're getting almost that tantrum when you're taking it away. I think it's really, yeah. I mean, you see it in middle school kids too. I mean, you know, I mean, you get in high mean, school <laughs> and high school, yeah, college. Yeah. Now you got esports. The only thing you think you got esports now. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I I watch those. I'm I'm addicted to watching esports, so yeah. <laughs> I can't it, imagine. It, it really it. changes the brain chemistry when they're you know looking at a screen and uh, you're seeing the impact of um, you know uh, the, sort of the chemicals flowing in the brain and giving the kids good good feelings. And it's you know you you kind of uh, you know they're going through withdrawal when you take it away, literally. You know, I, guess Brian, I didn't I, think about I that heard, point. Um, I was listening to something similar along this line, and it talked about that there's different kinds of reward Uh, like dopamine is one and there's others and some are more powerful than others. So screen time, and I I can't remember the details. Maybe you can help me, but screen time gives you, I think they said dopamine hits of like tiny rewards, kind of like gambling, lots of variable. I might get a message. I might get a Snapchat, you know, that, which is different from I'm biking outside with my best friend and it's beautiful out. That's a different right. kind of reward. It, mm-hmm. Is that sound right? Yes. Yes. That makes and so our kids are not and, getting and, that. 
Right. And I think, you know, when we're outside, we're taking in like sensory data from a lot of different places where basically everything is very is coming through the eyes, which have a tremendously large, you know, center in the brain. And so it's kind of I think it's magnifying everything that we're taking in. Whereas when you're bicycling, you know, you got the wind, you got other things going on, but it's not that it's not that intensity and the focus that. It is when you're playing, you know, a game or looking at a computer screen. Yeah. Like that makes writing. so much sense because it was. And even when I was asking my kids, hey, do you want to FaceTime your Bapa and Nana? And they love doing that. They love showing them the activities. He didn't look up, didn't look up. I mean, it was it was it was almost like a completely different kid. These kids it's were it's, just it's a real opposites. Yeah, it's a real high. I mean, it, it, it is. is. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Well, according to them, uh, the trash man took their their iPads, as they call them. So I needed to do something drastic because I did not like what I was seeing. And I'll probably introduce it in in lower increments or something. I, mean, I think their age just wasn't ready. Yeah, something you may want to do is just have like a timer or something, you know, so, you know, they hear a beep and then like they know that they have five more minutes, like just to make that kind of fade into that transition. Interesting. Okay. Might do those kind of things help? Yeah, they do. Okay. They, yeah. Um, the other the other trend I want to say is that I, I foresee that there's going to be a lot of teachers that are going to decide to retire at the end of this oh. year. I think for some of them, this has been overwhelming mm -hmm. and they just really can't, ba you know, they can't balance this um, and, the, and the technology and they're going to, um, if they were thinking about it, I think they're going to take retirement. So I, I would foresee that that's going to happen across the United States. Wow. As well. That's really good insight, Brian. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it definitely we're you know, the education system is being disrupted. Yes. <laughs> you know, we are going through a massive disruption. The yeah. enterprise is being disrupted. Gallup, where I work, mm -hmm. we've been writing a ton about this for the last three years. So we right. were a little bit ahead of this and thinking about remote workers and what the new environment was. We just didn't know how fast we didn't know how right. fast it was going to happen. Right. We've been talking about this. And I think the workplace is much better off than it, than our education system. And there's still disruption in the enterprise, still disruption in business. But man, right. education is being disrupted in like it's just in incredible rates. Yeah. Hey, before I wrap this, uh, Nathaniel, let me give you one more shot. And Brian, you, well, anything else that you'd want to say in this kind of context before we kind of we could go on for like three hours? Yeah. Uh, but anything else? Any other final thoughts, Nathaniel? No, other than you know everyone just has to have a lot of patience and grace with each other. Yeah. Your teachers are working extremely hard to help your kid. You're working extremely hard to help your kid, you know, and the kids are working hard, you know, it's, everyone has to be patient and kind and, you know, forgiving when there's yeah. mistakes. So we're, we're all doing our best to get through it and it is what it is, you know? Yeah. Oh, good thoughts, Brian. Final thoughts? Yeah, you know, like what Nathaniel said, um, you know, I, I see my students that are trying to do the best they can with the resources they have. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, teachers are doing a tremendous job considering what they, you know, have laid before them. Um, and they, they'll continue to do a wonderful job with the kids. I think they're all trying to reach kids in, in, in different ways. Um, I think that, you know, it, I think teachers themselves need a lot of support and they could find it in Facebook groups or even Twitter groups or whatever their PLN. I think it's really important for them to form their own community so they can reflect on their practices and get the kind of support that they, that they need amongst their peers. And I think that's really important. Mike, final thoughts on this, you, you, you know, uh, what do you, what do you think? My final thoughts are that um, I, I love, I hope, that the education system is getting the attention it deserves right now because of all this, because I have just, I, I don't think anyone has had a deeper respect for what everyone is doing in the education space um, is doing than, than right now. I mean, I think we all realize, first of all, how much work you guys, but I, the reaction from the educational community has been faster than most businesses on how to do this, right? How do we engage our kids? How do we get going? So uh, thank you to both of you for whatever you do for, for what you do, not whatever you do, uh, for what you guys do. And just, I, I hope everyone just appreciates what uh, the whole educational community is doing. I think it's been fantastic. I've been blown away with the reaction from my boys, teachers, from uh, my coworkers, teachers, and, and what the education system has been doing. And I, uh, so I think everyone appreciates it. If you guys don't hear that enough, you can hear it from me. We, uh, we appreciate the hard work you guys are putting in to, to keep our youth educated. Thanks. 
Yeah, no, I, I echo that. Appreciate you guys. We're, we're four voices in this and there are many more <laughs> than that. And this is not the be all end all of, I don't know if we solved any problems tonight, but certainly had some great conversations around it. I think, you know, I'm a, I want to end with this from a, from a community standpoint. So as a community, we have the ability to help in this situation. Like Nathaniel, you said it yourself, you've learned a lot from just kind of hanging in this community, right? There's been a lot of discussions and you've taught us a lot. Uh, you've come on and talked about Chromebooks and we've, we've learned from you, right? It's a, a, a mutual learning community. Uh, we would, we'd miss the boat, gentlemen and ladies who are listening tonight. We would miss the boat if we didn't take some opportunities when lockdown maybe ends and we can get out of our house and maybe do some things safely together to get back into our communities and, and be a voice to help. Like, I think we have some of the answers to jump in here, even if it's just mentoring another teacher on technology mm -hmm. or helping the school. Nathaniel, I'm sure there are, there are moments when you could use a helping hand from some parents to do some things. You're going to need to bring all these Chromebooks back in. <laughs> They're going <laughs> to, right. They're going to need to be cleaned and formatted and worked with, right? You haven't thought about that until just now. He's like, oh, jeez. No, we, we, we've been thinking about that. It's an it's oh. a interesting uh, challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's 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 challenges in our communities that, that need to be met. And I'd love to see and I'd love to hear stories from, from our listeners of how they're going out and helping and being a part of it. And, and maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a school, but maybe it's a church or maybe it's a civic organization or maybe it's first responders or, you know, I, I've, I've gone on record saying if they could ever figure out, like, if you've had this thing before, if you've had, co you know, the, the COVID and then you're now immune. If I knew that, I'd go volunteer at hospitals every weekend to just say, like, look, put me in harm's way. Like, you know, I think we can help in this, in this case. So if you're, you're listening to this, if you're on the road or you're at home, I don't know, your listening patterns have changed. This is disrupted podcasting too. Podcast is listening. Probably the three of you are listening to podcasts differently than you listened to them eight weeks ago because you're, maybe your listening patterns have changed. I'd really like you to think through the summer, like how do, what could I do to volunteer? What could I do to help how could I take my talents and technology and apply them to my district or my local school or my local tech guy or whatever, right? And, and really kind of make a difference there. We'd love to hear those stories as they come in as well. So as you start doing this, maybe you're doing it now. Love to hear those stories. Send those to me or ping me, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv. We'd love to either feature those or hear from those or we can read them on the show. You can come on the show, talk about those kinds of things. We'd love to hear those as well. A couple of reminders on our way out. One, if you want to, kind of financially uh, help what we're doing here. I don't talk about this very much, but you can go to our Patreon page, theaverageguy.tv slash Patreon. We have a plan out there if you want to get involved. Really jump into one of our Discord, uh, or not one, our Discord group, theaverageguy.tv slash Discord. We got a whole bunch of different channels in there. Really great con uh, communication. We haven't forgot about you on Facebook either. Theaverageguy.tv slash Facebook. That's still going on out there. I kind of post the show notes, but a lot of the conversations move to Discord. If you've been hesitant to move to Discord, get past it. Like, Get us get over on the Discord side. There's a lot of stuff going on uh, there as well. If you want to contact me, send me an email, Jim at the average guy TV. If you're on YouTube right now, do me a favor. Just if you stayed this long, I don't know, there's there's 10 of you. Go down and hit the like button. That actually helps on YouTube. So just go down. It's right, it's right down there. Just click on the like button and subscribe while you're there. Those things actually do help us get discovered on YouTube. So I'd appreciate that as well. Don't forget the average guy.tv platform hosted by uh, Maple Grove Partners. Get secure, reliable, high speed hosting from people that you know and you trust. If you need a site, plans are as little as $10. Christian will set you up uh, both web and media hosting. He basically does it all. Uh, plans start at $10. Bucks, Maple Grove Partners. Dot com And we are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern out here at TheAverageGuy.tv live. If you've made it this far, chances are you're going to like to come back next Thursday. So come back. Uh, it does not quite as serious next week. We're going to talk about lawn care and technology <laughs> associated. <laughs> kind of a nice break. It's been a little heavy over the last couple of weeks. And so kind of a nice break as we think about summer and doing some lawn care. And Dave McCabe will be back. He's always fun to do that as well. We want to thank you for joining us tonight, Brian and Nathaniel. Thank you for coming on as well. We'll do, a little, we'll do a little bit of a post show. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. Okay. 
you guys can stay around. We've been going an hour and a half. So uh, you're welcome. I'm going to stay out here a little bit and talk with some folks in the chat room. Okay. Brian, Nathaniel, if you need to go, you can. I'm going to head on out. Okay. Here. Yeah. No, right on. Uh, Brian, thank I'll you. I'll stick around. Okay. Brian, thank you for coming out you're tonight. I appreciate great. it. Really no, I appreciate great. it. Thanks for reaching out. Yeah, and um, maybe we can catch up with you in the fall as we've kind of learned some things through the Absolutely. summer. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Sounds yeah, good. we can get, get Chris Brian. back on the show. Yeah, yeah we'll get Chris. We'll Here. get Chris as well. Thanks, Brian. All right, bye. Thanks. Yeah, I wonder what happened to Chris tonight. Oh, he in no him. message from him? No. Oh, okay. I pinged him on Twitter too. He's usually super responsive. Something, something family must have come up. It's too bad. It's okay. It worked out. We had a lot to, t- we had a lot to say. Nathaniel, thank you for your, for your input on that. It's really good to hear kind of the stories, the nuts and bolts from the ground. Yeah. You know, I just mean, be reminded of those things. It, yeah. I mean, we're all trying to figure it out. I mean, that's, that's the frustrating yeah. part. The first couple of weeks we were like, oh, what do we do this? Okay. We'll try it. And then it fails. And we're like, okay, start over. Let's, you know, and we really, in the early mm-hmm. weeks, we as the tech team really forgave ourselves for mistakes very quickly. Yeah. And there wasn't any, oh man, I can't believe you did that wrong in this. And we just like, oh, that didn't work. Let's move on. Let's keep going. And it yeah. wasn't, there wasn't a lot of time spent on blame or, you know, anything. It was just like, keep moving. One of the things that I think is true is when we have crises like this, you get a little bit of window where everybody pulls together and you're able to cut through some red tape and you're, you're able to streamline some things and you're able, you know, people really pull together. It's the best of humanity. It's, it's humans at their best. And that is always just a really small window. (laughs) You know, it comes, it opens and it's great. And then, we figure some things out and then it slowly closes and then it slams shut and we go back to fighting each other. Right. And, and that's always not, that's not, that part's not always the bad part, but um, I really hope during while this window is open and you're you know, just kind of what you're saying of, Hey, people are working together and nobody's blaming and you can make some mistakes. And it's, I hope we can maybe put a block <laughs> in that window for the summer to keep it open and when we start again in the fall, it doesn't go slamming shut and people start blaming. You know, I think I think it was Brian who said, or maybe it was you who said something about lawsuits. I think it was Brian. Yeah. You he know, he you mentioned think, oh, that. And I didn't even think about that. Like, no, it, I mean, my God, I hope we don't. So, you know, Mike, teacher, told it, you're muted, Mike. No, I said, yeah, I hadn't thought that either. Yeah. And teachers are mandatory reporters. So you can imagine if I'm doing a Zoom call or a Google Meet or whatever with kids, one kid, multiple kids, and if I see something as a teacher going on in the background that has me concerned that I feel like a student's safety is at risk, as a teacher, I have to report it. Mm-hmm. So that's that's just one. So when we used to do, we used to do homebound students. So the students would be homebound for various reasons, and we'd try to deliver some element of class over video that was more of a social relationship connection, not instruction. We had the parents sign an agreement form saying, I, as a parent, I'm going to have visibility into the classroom that I normally wouldn't have. Therefore, I have to respect the privacy of all the students and the teachers in that classroom. And I can't go to my mom's club down the street and say, do you know what I saw in class the other day? This kid was doing this, blah, blah, blah. That's out the window. You know, so we've had debates about okay, we can record Google Meets. Is that hurt us as a district or help us? If we record it, it covers our butts if something went bad. But if we record it, then we have to retain it as records for a certain number of time. And if you didn't report something that showed up in a recording. Right. So it could help and harm the teacher. And it invades the privacy of the students. And a lot of the, the synchronous learning, we're very sensitive to some students don't want to show their office, bedroom, crowded, kitchen you know they don't want the rest of the class to see how they live you know so parts of it is great but a lot of it is we've been just kind of like do what you think is best by your gut and just cross your fingers we'll get through this and then next fall we may have more strict regulations about what you can and can't do i didn't even think about that when you said the you know the, the kids not wanting to show in their back like what's going on do you remember like what middle school and elementary school like like showing up like getting made fun of for the clothes you were wearing like oh, not the wearing hair, the right the clothes, haircut you the got haircut and yeah. now that kid has to worry about on video his grandma cooking like you know people living with him like whatever it is whatever they're embarrassed by it could be anything it's just I mean mentally they was so taxing thinking about what I was going to wear to school every day 
mm-hmm. because I knew I was going to get made fun of for something. And now and you got to worry about your sister or your mom or everything. your aunt that lives with you. What are they going to do? And so I, I think, think there's a lot of grace of saying, yeah, turn on your video. Oh, yep. I see you. You can turn it off. You know, yeah, there's a lot of that. Well, that's a really good point, Nathaniel. That is a really good man. This is making me think like, you, well, you, you, you know, you, you, uh, you and I, and, and a lot of people that listen to this, take our jobs for granted. Like yeah. Jim, you said, Oh, we've been preparing for remote work all you know, years. We're getting really good. And my wife's company, she's more busy than she's ever been remote yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. But we have, you know, millions of people that are laid off with no job because uh, their yeah. job depended on foot traffic. Right. Their yeah. job depended yep. on that. And so, yeah. If we hey, we got to figure this out as a country. No, this is it's a it's a complete disruption. I mean, it is just a complete. And I, I don't think, you know, I don't think just say tomorrow, which it's looking more and more like Monday is going to be this day. They're trying to flip the switch and turn things back on, right? And I don't think it's that easy. I don't think people just go back to their jobs. I don't think we just put all the pieces. You know, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, and those pieces are not going to fit back together again. And so as we, we think about, I mean, companies are going to have to go back and rehire the, the, it's, it's, it's what are they upset applesauce? Like it's completely, it's a mess of people out there, you know, 38 million or whatever that number is, 25 million on unemployment, whatever that, that's a big gigantic number. That's not a pool. That's just going to go back to their jobs, right. That they right. had before they're going to, some are going to think, oh, maybe I'll upgrade. Like maybe there's a new job out there uh, that I could do that I hated my job before. Maybe there's a new, you know, there's a new place I can go, which means as employers, we're going to, when we do open those jobs again, there is going to be a flood of applicants. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so how do we handle those and who gets hired? And then there's all this training that's going to have to get involved. And there's like, I mean, it's not, I, I, I tend to think that a lot of people just think, oh yeah, if I worked at, like Roma is our favorite Italian restaurant down the street. If I worked at Roma's, they're just going to go back to Roma's. No, they're actually not. Right. And, and we furloughed some folks at Gallup and, and um, will they come back? Hopefully. Is that a guarantee? I don't know. You know, um, you know, it depends on who unfurloughs first. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I try to tell my 18 year old, like he lost his job. He worked in an escape room. Right. That was right. closed immediately. Yeah. And I'm like, you might want to start looking now because you're not going to be in a, a desirable candidate in a few weeks when adults like me are trying to get the job that you want, right. you know, whether right. it's delivery driver. Or <laughs> That's things. a good point. Like you're going to be competing with much more qualified people, you know, and he, he wants to go to a technical school in the fall, but we don't know if it'll be open. Right. And so I think, I think that point of, if you're already an online university, you better start ramping up and hiring people now, because I am sure a lot of people are going to start doing online classes this fall. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cut the risk, get some credits, live at home, write it out. Yeah. Get really efficient, Mike. Well, and, and coming, coming back to work, even you think about people like my whole issue has been childcare and Andrew uh, in chat brings up a good point that um, his son's daycare closed permanently yep. and like our, our school that our boys go to, they, I mean, they asked extremely nicely, well, you guys, I know you can't send your kids, will you continue to pay tuition um, while you're gone just so we can make sure we stay. And I think obviously the majority of us did, so they're able to stay open, but they're a small, I mean, they only have two locations. They're not a national yep. brand. Had, had yep. everyone said, no, our kids aren't going like, so I've been paying for something for the last month and a half. Everyone had said, no, they would have had to close their doors too. So I can, I can definitely see that most places, luckily they asked because initially I was like, well, they're not going, I probably don't have to pay. Not even, you know, you're just not in that mindset, right? Not thinking, Hey, if we don't pay them, they might not be able to stay open. Even yeah. if we need them to go back. They won't and, be uh, here they in the fall. Here. Exactly. Yeah. They won't be right. Here. In and- May or June, whenever one month, especially for these smaller places mm-hmm. could knock a lot of them off. Yeah. Well, and some of them are being asked to do childcare for essential workers. So they, they That's have ours did, yeah. reduced, reduced kids and reduced sites and they have that, but that's not the same. It's not the same amount of revenue and oh. that they can't pay and they've had to yeah. lay off. And, and it's kind of getting to the point is like, Oh, wait a minute. You know, we've only got 10 kids at a site, you know, that's not economical. Who's going to help us continue to do it because 
Now me, the small daycare, you know, childcare owner, I can't afford to only watch 10 kids. Yeah. But you're telling me the state's telling me I have to do it. Yep. That's a good point. That actually, I didn't even think about it. that's probably why they asked the rest of us parents to continue to pay yeah. tuition. Um, cause they need to stay open because they did stay open. So they, they opened it up to technically everyone, but they said, Hey, we have a few parents here are, who are the first responders working in the hospitals. And if you could please, you know, keep those spots open for those kids, we'd really appreciate it. Um, it, it was very interesting. It was, it was one of those times where you felt bad about yourself. Like, wow, I didn't think that all the way through. Like yeah. my first response was, uh, this is great. I don't have to pay for childcare cause I'm watching them. Right. And then you're like, Oh, like how selfish yeah. I did not yeah. think about the second line where it's these people who the business would have closed down. Um, Jim said, I actually have to go. I have a report I got to get done for work for yeah, tomorrow no morning. So, no worries. uh, they know it was great talking to you. I yeah, love this conversation. Guys. It's so, uh, it was fantastic. Yeah. So something that's really near and dear to my heart and obviously even more so my wife's heart. So I think she was actually watching upstairs because I got a text that, uh, you know, he said occupational therapy. So the, she got a yeah. shout out. Her, 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 uh, is that her area? Shout out. Yeah, that's her area. Yeah. Okay. She works occupational therapy and she also teaches. Is, Man, do you think I she's was, still listening? No, I, I heard no. actually, I heard the shower running. So oh, shoot. I was <laughs> going to say, basement, you can Hannah, hear everything. Stop so. blocking me. Hannah, yeah, stop yeah. blocking me. Yeah. You could have said that earlier and she probably would have heard you. So I texted her and I was like, Hey, it's education tonight. You might be interested. So I, I got to come by. I got a cigar for you. So I've kind of been waiting for another beer to show up. And then I was yeah. going to bring the, the beer and we got a Cuban. We'll have to do it on, um, on, uh, FaceTime or something with each other. I'm, I would love it. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Right. Thanks. See you, See you guys later. Have, have a good evening. Thank you. Oh, and you know, it's funny because I come on and I'm like, gosh, I wonder what I'm going to talk about. And I don't usually write notes and, and then no, you got plenty to say it yeah. spills out. Yeah. And no, it's, you did a great job rambling. tonight. I mean, it's it there. I always tell people that when, you know, they're like, well, what am I going to say? And I'm like, yeah. trust me, you'll have plenty yeah. to say. Well, you you'll do a great job of prompting. I'm, well, thanks. It's, that's my job, right? That's yeah. what, yeah. that's what I like to do is to get just kind of get the conversation going and then, and then kind of let people kind of talk through it. It's super fascinating to me. I, like I am really glad I get to live during this time. Um, Brandon in the chat room yeah. said an interesting comment that this really shows the class system we have between information workers and non-information workers. And there is a lot of truth to that in, um, and I've tried to cap, I've tried to um, both here and on ask the podcast coach on Saturday mornings, I'm trying to catch myself of saying, and when we're all home, because we're not all home. Like there's a whole, like that's actually a smaller number than the, the ones that are still out there, you know, raising pigs and cows and chickens. Well, I'm sure, and, I'm sure you know. in Yo Omaha, you're seeing the impact on agriculture in your area too. Yeah. I mean, the whole pork processing in Sioux Falls and Worthington, yep. Minnesota, down yep. in the north, yep. southwest. And I up mean, in Kearney, we have a big chicken, yep. big chicken plant Poultry. up in, in Kearney. And that, you know, and there, it's just like that was kind of the best kept secret is like those factories were kept open regardless. And they, you know, Tyson was like, hey, okay, on breaks, you have to be six feet from each other and, but the work is not set up to be pandemic friendly. They're no. standing right next to each other. They're cutting into live, you know, not live, but they're, you know, they're processing mm -hmm. meat. We've kept America fed uh, here in the Midwest with those plants staying open at a little bit of a cost at a four to one, like those in those cities, they have four times or five times more illness and death in those cities than yeah. they have in the rest of the state. Yep. And so they've, they have paid the price for that, for that to keep, you know, a lot of people were like, you know, there's this run on food at first and then the food kept showing up and it was just as cheap. And people were like, Hey, this doesn't, this doesn't add up. Yeah. It doesn't add up because we're the delay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And we, I, I think we, we didn't shut those plants down probably like we probably should have, you know, and there will be a lot of interesting uh, documentaries and movies and books and articles written about this period in a way that will have some reflection on what the actual impact was. What were the real numbers? Which demographics were most impacted? Uh, yeah. I watched the documentary about uh, the 1918 flu and it's fascinating because I didn't know a lot about it. And one of the um, specialists, an epidemiologist, I think she said, I'm amazed 
how quickly the country forgets. Yeah. 1918, 100 years ago, and nobody remembers all the lessons and what happened and the patterns of today versus then. You know, early on, everybody's like, oh, it's no big deal. It's going to go away. Don't worry about it. October was their worst month. Yeah. The good thing is, 500 to 600,000 people died in that year plus span. That's a lot. Yeah. We're not going to hit those numbers because we have better medical and things, but it, it's still impactful. Um, yeah. This, if, if there's any saving grace, I think in any of this, this first wave got us kind of woke us up <laughs> like, Oh, <laughs> Oh, this is what you meant when you, when you said overwhelming in the healthcare system. This is what you meant. And, yeah. and it, we didn't, and, and we did in some areas, but we, we didn't in a lot of areas, right? But it is, it is highlighted. We got to get our act together for the second wave and be like, okay, guys, we need to prioritize some things and be ready because there will be, there will be a second wave of this. The, the, the big question yeah. is how do we respond to it? Because I'm not sure we can handle another complete shutdown type deal. You know, I just, right. I don't know. If, I don't know if the psyche is there. Is it the right thing to do? Probably in a perfect world. Yes. Um, uh, you know, it, can it be done? I don't know. You know, I think what the summer could give us is some time to reflect on what worked in the spring and what was good and what could be better. I don't like the term essential worker, um, who are essential employees or businesses and which are non-essential because sort of implies that some, work is more valuable or important than others. I think I, I would prefer more phrasing around which, which is a safe workplace or safe yeah. work. You know, the lawn care company that's going around turning on sprinklers and mowing, that's safe. They're all uh, outside and doing their own right. thing and not interacting with people. Whereas, you know, basketball stadiums, that would be an unsafe, but essential versus non-essential. I'm not a big fan of that phrase. Tony, Tony says, oh, let me wait for that to pop up in the chat here. It takes a second. Um, yeah. And yeah. I think, I think there the is, one way, <laughs> I think there is, um, I, I think there's some areas we, we corrected a little too hard on where it's like, um, they, they could probably still continue. Yeah. He's, uh, Tony says people can, can't follow the clearly marked aisles in the grocery store that are one way. I haven't been to a grocery store since they've implemented that. The last time, I think it's been four weeks since I've you been in a grocery store. You didn't even mention HelloFresh today. I didn't. No, <laughs> no it actually, and it would actually have been a really good, uh, a really good, we were running long. And so I, yeah, I decided sorry. to cut that part out. Um, it has, um, I mean, HelloFresh has been a big part of our plan, our the way we eat during this time. Yeah. And we, we've had some long discussions. I mean, it's pretty expensive. It's an expensive way to eat. But, and we pared down on it some and we've, you know, we have, um, you know, but we've had some conversations about what does it mean to the, to our, our weekly budget. And then from a convenience standpoint and, and, and even from like, like we could get meat from them maybe where we couldn't get it in the store. Yeah. Like, you know, and we get fresh produce through that, through that, where we, that might not be available. It comes in a box. Like it's actually been a really, it's been a very helpful pandemic service. Well, and you're probably saving money on gasoline and some other things. Yeah. So maybe you're, you know, maybe it's neutral. Uh, I can afford it right now. Yeah. If, if, you know, say we go into the fall and we go into a major, major recession, right? It's very possible. Yeah. Um, well, it'd probably be one of the things that would go. Now I have a stack of recipe cards and some favorite new favorite meals Yeah. that we've gotten out of that thing. And we've already, so we, we, we went through all our cards and picked out our 10 favorite recipes. And then each week, uh, Friday, when we're, we're planning the meal for the, the, the menu for the next week, we go, okay, what do we want? Which one of these do we want? And we pull it out. And then Sarah, when she shops, she makes sure we have the right ingredients to be able to do that. And we're cooking off the HelloFresh carts. That's yep. a win. Well, and you got, you know what you like, you know, and you know yeah. how to prepare right. it after doing it the first right. time. You're like, oh, yeah. okay. Now I know the shortcuts, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we try to plan very carefully. So we only go to the store once a week, you know, and we get everything we need and, um, yeah. Tony, Tony says something cool. He said the guy was looking for, uh, no, that's not the one we donated toilet paper to a friend who had four children, one special needs that can't get out and get it. Um, 
Yeah, I didn't realize that's still a shortage. That's a thing still. Toilet is paper it? hoarding. Is yeah. It? Oh. I didn't. I mean, I was surprised. I was at CVS picking stuff, and I was walked through the aisle. I'm like, are these empty shelves still? And there was like one or two toilet paper packs. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll pick one up. Twelve bucks for six rolls. I was like, yeah. is this normal? <laughs> It is now. It's the that's the it's the new normal. Brandon says that's a great idea with the cards. I should put all my recipes on a card. Yeah, you know they did this a hundred years ago. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. right. I mean, just it's funny we got away from that. The idea of a cookbook or a recipe. Um, uh, he says Tony says it is here. Shagged a thirty pack at Costco yesterday. Um, you know what else that I've done? This is funny. Yeah, Everybody yeah. in the chat would appreciate. It. Six people, including myself, have purchased a new TCL Roku TV. Really? Like, electronic sales have gone up. People are buying TVs, yeah. monitors, because yeah. they're, yeah. they're at home. And those right. TCL Rokus are like goldmine in terms of quality, features, ease of use, price point. Yeah. So many people are like, oh, Where'd my you buy TV that? just died. I got my Best Buy. They do curbside. Mm. I had a gift card for my yeah. birthday and I'm yeah. like, all right, I'm upgrading. Got a TCL. You pull up, you tell them on the app you're here. You pop the trunk, they put it in, you drive away. And, but several people have been like upgrading the TCL that the Roku built in. Nice, nice feature. Tony says his Costco is out of ground beef and frozen chicken breasts. We've got some in the freezer. Did a pork shoulder today. That was one of those. We got a meat place nearby that we picked up some pork shoulder. And I made a whole tub of, of um, what do we call that? After we, after we shred it, shredded, shredded, shredded. pork. What do we call that? Pulled yeah. pork. Pulled pork. Thank you. And, uh, and got a tub of it. I, and if, if we don't, you know, it depends how we may, I may have it tomorrow and put half of it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure we have that kind of there. By the way, that smoking that pork shoulder all day was just the was the most fun. Like, because you put it on, and then I can walk away from it for hours at a time, do meetings, you know, work, pop yeah, out you can at check lunch. On it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, pop out at lunch. Andrew says you bought a laser printer, if that counts. So. The two <laughs> the two busiest stores that I've been to during this whole thing are like the Home Depot type store. That's crazy busy. Yeah. And ours even said like, no children. Like if you're under 16, we're going to not let you in the store because you're just running around touching stuff. Right. And the right. other is micro center, the electronic store. They've got it down. Like you queue up outside six feet down the uh, parking lot. They only let a certain number of people. And as soon as you get in, you get hand sanitizer and a mask. If you're not bringing your own. Wow. And they've got it. They, I mean, they're nonstop people coming in and out, buying stuff, pick up all day. Yeah. So those places are doing all right. Did you have to buy, okay, so besides the TV, to, did you have to buy any additional tech during this? Did, did you buy any additional tech for work? Oh, well, mm, well, just trying different headsets. Like I said, yeah. you know, the yeah. Jabras, this, this 60, this is not 65T, Evolve, 40, Evolve. It's probably is a 40T. Yeah, these are pretty good. A Bluetooth um, or Bluetooth, and I wanted wireless. I was like, oh, I hate being tied down with a wire. But then the audio still wasn't great, and then I got fatigue on my ears. So that's why I've just said, you know what? The microphone. I figured out how to get the arm right between the two monitors, and I have a a nice twenty seven inch high res Dell that I use most of the time. That that's made a big difference. Yeah. I had that before, but having a really good monitor helps. It like does. If I was just staring at a small laptop screen for my work, oh. it would just drive me crazy. But even so, I've got a I've got dual twenty four IPSs here, and then I have a thirty four curved Dell. Yeah, that I bought, I bought yeah, I heard of you got that at work. I did. How did they get you a thirty four? Because it was great. Because their Gallup is great. <laughs> they don't know they, better. <laughs> they are great. Well, they started pricing out at the time. They could get these thirty fours cheaper than they could get two. Oh, you know, two two 24 inch or something. And so they, they went on a plan where they started just replacing, if you had dual monitors, they just replaced the two monitors with one 34 curved. And it's not, 34 curved is not technically the same space as two 24s. You get, you get more yeah. space in a 24 than you yeah, do with, yeah. with 34, but it, it works out fine. Well, the resolution on this thing is incredible. I mean, yeah. it's like butter for my eyes. I mean, I yeah. just, I'm in heaven with it. And these two, these two, these IPS monitors yeah. I have are just awesome. I stare at them all day. So, um, yeah, when, before, when I came home and I didn't have this monitor and I was plugged in, I was using the laptop and then I was yeah. using a 
another monitor. Oh, I was like, I was like, my eyes. Well, it's like, like you've said hurt. before, you know, getting by for one day or two days when you're homesick versus so I'm here every day. Yeah. All day. Yeah. having a It really depressed me, year. to be honest with you. When I thought, oh, I can't, if I have to look at this for the next six, seven, yeah. eight weeks, I'm done. I can't, I can't do this. And so fortunately they let me go pick it up and now I love it. I sit here, you know, I sit this way yep. and just, I type all day on that thing. It's just, it's great. Yeah. I, otherwise I, I got a docking station. So I hired wired my laptop in my work laptops got into the docking station, which has ethernet and then the different USB. And that just makes it simple to take in and off. Um, just trying different things. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, it's and that's I, kind of my what I do. I'm on this all day, so it's not like uh, other teachers who are are doing it occasionally or less less intensive. Right. Have you changed your media watching or the way you consume movies, TVs, that kind of stuff during this time, or is it the same as before? I've watched less TV. Um, I thought, you know, all these people are like, oh, I got so much extra time because I'm at home and we don't have activities. Yeah. I totally get it. But, yeah. you know, I, I watch a half hour show. We watched uh, The Naked Gun with Leslie Nielsen oh, with the nice. boys. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. hilarious. So yeah. it's, you know, it's more to spend time with the kids and watch a movie. Um, there's all these series that I want to watch because it's like HBO free and this. And I just, y- you get up early, you walk, you eat, you take care of the dog, you sit down, you work, you take a break, then you have lunch, then you work, and then it's dinner. And then you do, we've been yeah. doing Zoom meetings with friends and playing trivia yeah. and board games on Zoom and, and doing that kind of thing. And by the time we're done, we're just like, oh, I'm done. I'm tired. I, I have to get back up and do it again. And yeah. I think like a lot of people, it's some days you're like, okay, I can do this and feeling confident. And other days you're like, just want to crawl under the blanket and not, you know, participate, but we got to do it. They're counting on us. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it hasn't changed mine at all. I don't watch any more TV now. No kids for the most part. And yeah, it, it, adult kids are different. Like that <laughs> is totally, it hasn't yeah. changed my habits. That habit. And if I, do, I never watch TV, I don't, I don't watch any TV at this point. And I've kind of quit watching movies. Mm-hmm. And, and so it just, it hasn't, it's one of those things I hear other podcasters like, oh yeah, I'm watching so much more. And I'm like, yeah, I oh, how do you do that? I don't know. I think some people can watch movies while they work. Yeah, I can't. I can't. Oh, I, if I'm going to watch a show or a movie, I'm focused. I'm paying attention, even if it's not like high quality. But some people must do that because I don't know how they can come like uh, um, Entertainment 2.0. I don't know how they can come back every week and be like, oh, here's the seven shows that I've been watching this week. And I'm like, well, eh. I watch oh, seven yeah. shows a Richard, month. <laughs> Richard and Josh. Yeah, I've been, I've, been, I've been binging on them recently too. Yeah, and I'm like, Richard watches a lot of TV. And I'm like, how do you do that? Like, how do you find that much time with as busy as he is? I just don't know how he does it. Yeah. I, that's I why know. I assume they must I be know. able to Josh like have a show going in the background. Must. I don't think so. I don't, yeah. I don't think he's that kind of guy. I think he actually watches everything he talks about on there. Okay. One more question before I let you go. Okay. Vacation. Like the movie. What? No, no. <laughs> like, what we used to do in the summer when uh, you know we had a we had a week off and we went somewhere and like what do you th- what are you thinking for the summer? Well, my our you know like a lot of people our spring break was canceled, mm-hmm. so right. I got hours back. Right. Now I'm using a few because I'm going down to Arizona to be with my dad for a week, and I'll try to work some there, but I got to set my expectations really low. But in the summer, I, I don't know. You know what I'd 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 love is just a week to do nothing at the house. If I can't travel Mm -hmm. just a week to putter through some projects, you know, I've been tweaking my unraid build because of the, you know, renewed interest in that. And it's been fun. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to work on VMs. I'm going to learn how to do VMs on unraid. That's going to be a a project. And my son's been getting into it a little more. He's built a Linux box with some old parts and he wants to run a windows VM. And cool. So we kind of do that together. But, um, I, I, I don't think we're traveling. If anything, if we get the restrictions lifted, we're going to go north. We're going to go up to a cabin, do some mountain biking, well, hopefully get together with some friends. I mean, that's we miss that a lot, yeah. our neighborhood friends. And we kind of hang out virtually, and once in a while, somebody will drop something off. But I, I don't know. 
it's it's going to be unlike any other. Yeah. Do you have any sense of what you're going to do? No, and we're not a big. I haven't taken a like a traditional vacation in five years, so we don't. That's not uh, for. But it, it's just a thought, you know. Like what what is what does that mean for people? How is that going to work? Where are people going to go? What are people going to do? We need it. Like we, we need to take some time. People need to take time off there. As we get into summer, people are getting like, people are going to lose their minds if they yeah. don't get away from this in some way. And so that, that I'm worried about, I'm a little weird and then I can just keep going and going and going and going. Yeah. I don't, I, I just don't, it, for me, it's different. Like I really like since I really like what I do Yeah, and I like doing this, I mean, but, but I, I know people need it. And so I, what I miss is kind of business travel. You know, I was doing some business travel. I had gone to London in December. Yeah. I was, I was planning to go to Australia in August. There's no way that's happening. And, uh, and so that, that maybe the business travel had kind of filled in for me on the vacation side of things where I was getting some of that, you know, in the business. So I go down to Dallas a couple times a year to do some recruiting. I go out to Florida to do some recruiting. That know, kind like, of, that gets your fix of like, oh, I'm seeing a different part of the country or yeah, getting out and different getting around, people. even though it's, yeah. Connect with different people, see different parts of the, of the U.S. or whatever. Yeah. It's just, I, listen, I wasn't a huge fan of airplanes before this all happened. Yeah. So like I, I begrudgingly, I mean, I went to, I went to London, but it was, I was kind of torn, loved being there, loved that city. Like if I moved anywhere, if I could move anywhere in the world, I'd move to London in a hmm. second. Just love that city. But getting there and getting back, not, not, not for me a little, I was a little terrified. Most of the, the way there and the way back, just inside, it just that many people jammed into a plane. You well, know. now's the time to go, man. No, I mean, no. from everything I hear, it's going right? to be me and four other people on the plane. Yeah, so. yeah, I know. No, you're, 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 um, you're actually right. It that it this this may I probably should if I was ever thinking about doing. Christian gets gets married at the end of July, and I've kind of put that on hold. Yeah, but you know, maybe maybe if I get that ticket far enough in advance, it'll be me and three other people on the plane. Yeah, well, I, I worry about getting through the airport, not riding the plane from what I'm hearing, you know, um, which and if you plan ahead, it's cheap. Like, I don't know if I told you I could have gotten the flight uh, four days in advance. I could have gotten a one way from Minneapolis to Phoenix for like sixty four dollars. <laughs> I waited till, you know, the day before, two days yeah. before, and it's, you know, more. Right. But OK, so now my flight's under three hundred dollars instead right. of for a round trip. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I hope the airlines can get through because now no, they'll bail those out for sure. Yeah. But maybe, yeah, maybe companies out. are going to say uh, what I heard was the term uh, one meeting flights or one meeting trips aren't yes. worth it anymore. Somebody right. said that. Yep. Like if you're going to fly, I, let's make it really valuable. I never understood those anyways. That was always to me a mystery. I was like, if I went to DC for work, I would plan a dozen things to do over the course of two days uh, to, to make sure that time was utilized properly. I never understood somebody was flying in for a day for a one hour meeting. I'm like, why didn't you just call or get on the, get on video? Like imagine how long of a meeting you could have if you made it a video meeting. So I never understood those. Now I'm glad those are going away. That's, that was unnecessary and stupid. Well, hopefully we see the benefit of like all this reduced flights and cars and stuff in the environment. So like, have you seen those air, air quality satellite photos of Beijing and yeah. all these places? You're like, oh, so that's what it looks like. It is man-made pollution. <laughs> here is your evidence right here. I know. Yeah. But it'll go back. You know, I don't, I, yeah. I don't think we can, that cat's out of the barn. That Man. horse yeah, uh, <laughs> out you of the said back. something about like spill the applesauce earlier. Uh, yeah, upset applesauce. Yeah, you you yeah, meant upset uh, the apple cart. I that's think. what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly. That's We're exactly. a good company. Uh, that's exactly. I have I have an analogy problem. Yeah, that's all right. It's I mean, it's from uh, Back to the Future and Biff. And yeah, he would always say things like "Make like a tree and get out of here." Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. <laughs> 
Well, Nathaniel, uh, thank you for taking the time tonight to to be on here. I appreciate it. Uh, if you'll hang yeah. tight for me one second. Uh, yep. If you're listening live, uh, why? It's been two hours and 13 minutes, but this we appreciate the, This is the crew. These yeah, are no, dedicated. these are the most engaged. We appreciate you guys being out there. We'll, um, we'll see you next week. Uh, do talk some lawn care and uh, appreciate you guys out there. Have a good weekend and uh, we'll see you next week.